Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad to be here with all of you tonight. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell. Always a pleasure to engage with all of you. We're going to have a great conversation here tonight. Once again, uh, yeah, we're going to do it. So let's go. The American century. I say that the century on which we are entering can be and must be the century of the common man. A radical redistribution of economic power. I mean, we know that racism is just is, is a byproduct of capitalism. Everything we do our race, if everything we put back in the hands of the people. We need a government that will make sure Americans are taken care of and organize the economy to serve the people, not the profits of a wealthy few. We now have the techniques and the resources to get rid of poverty. We got to start getting out there with the people. Get out of the movement and get to the mass. We need a government of action. Welcome, 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 everybody. So glad to be here with all of you. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell. It is always a pleasure to engage, always a pleasure to have a conversation here. Um, we're streaming and it's awesome. And we're back. Uh, you know, we just keep doing these streams. It is uh, Sunday evening, 4th of July weekend here in the United States of America. I am in my lovely Brooklyn apartment and we are going to have yet another one of our late night streams. It's going to be awesome. Absolutely awesome. So, yeah, the way these streams work, for those of you who may not be familiar, uh, the way these work is that I give my opening remarks. Uh, while I am giving my opening remarks, I am writing down your Super Chat questions. Uh, then from there, I do a roll call where I call you all out as I see you, names and locations, names and locations. We find out who it is on the other side of the camera, who is watching this. Um, and that's always fun, just a lot of fun. We get to find out who, who's on the other side of the camera, who it is, who's watching. Um, you know, we have quite a diverse community, many different corners of the United States and the world. And that's always great. Um, and then after that, after I do the roll call, then I answer your super chat questions for the rest of the night. So if there's something that you would like me to talk about in the second half of our program, the best thing for you to do is to send me a super chat right now or as we go along. Uh, send me a super chat. I will write it down. And in the second half of our show, I will do my best to give you an answer. Super chats make the second half of the show happen. So by all means, uh, send us a super chat. Get me talking. Uh, you know, you can throw me a softball and I can hit a home run or you can throw me a fastball and I can still hit a home run. Uh, as we say, you know, I always am looking to engage with all of you. I really enjoy having conversations with all of you. So, um, yeah, that's kind of what we're doing here tonight. So hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell. Now, uh, before we go any further, just a quick announcement because today is July 2nd, but, uh, coming up a week from tomorrow. Uh, is July 10th. And July 10th in New York City is going to be a tremendous day. Uh, July 10th is going to be awesome uh, because we have two big New York City events. The first of them is a protest, a demonstration that will be happening in the afternoon. Uh, we will be assembling at 43rd and 6th Avenue in Manhattan, 3 p.m., peace with Russia, peace with China, no police state. Uh, and that will be happening at 3 p.m. Uh, in Manhattan. Um, you know, uh, that'll be very, very cool. So I hope that uh, I hope that people can be there. And then after that, uh, not too far from there, we will be having. And here we go. Another event, an evening indoor panel on the U.S. legal system. Uh, it'll be called Money and American Injustice, How the Legal System Targets the Poor. Uh, that is the name 
of the panel that we'll be having, uh, Jose Vega, who is known for his great disruptions. Uh, he will be one of the speakers. Chris Halali, uh, who is, uh, you know, has run for Congress in the past, uh, you know, has uh, fought in Syria and is a law student. Uh, he will be speaking as well. Um, and uh, in addition to that, we will have Nick Brana of the People's Party. He will be speaking on the evening panels. Um, so it's going to be it's going to be pretty awesome uh, so that I hope that you can all uh, be there. I really hope that you can all be there. We would really love to uh, to have you there, um, you know, um, really love to have you there. Um, that would be great. That would be really, really, really great. Um, so there's that. Um, and uh, it's going to be great. Uh, I'll see you all there. Peter Coffin is making a documentary. Uh, I know Space LaRouche Liam is going to be there. Some other great folks are going to be there. It's, it's going to be pretty awesome. Uh, if you can't make it, or if you just can make it, but you still want to send a contribution, we would appreciate if you gave a donation to help with the costs of the event. Uh, so this is where you can donate. Uh, that goes straight to the CPI. Uh, this that's, that's the link, the Stripe link, where you can issue uh, donations uh, for the, um, you know, if you'd like to donate to help these events happen. We always can appreciate donations to help the event happen. Um, that would be a great way to support our work. Um, and I'll see you there. Uh, so yes, July 10th in Manhattan, New York city protest evening conference panel. It's going to be awesome. You don't want to miss it. You really don't want to miss it. Uh, it's going to be tremendous. It's going to be absolutely tremendous. I really hope that you can be there. Um, so yeah, that's going to be good. Um, so yeah, uh, keep, uh, keep the super chats rolling in. I'll be writing in the super chats as we go along. Super chats are what make the second half of our show happen. And on that note, I am going to start my opening remarks. So here we go. Here we go. Folks, I don't know if you saw this, but Syria Syria is a country the U.S. imperialists have been trying to overthrow the government of since the 1980s. Uh, the United States has been trying to destabilize Syria. Uh, the regime change operations against the Syrian Arab Republic really escalated uh, in 2011. Uh, the USA used the Arab Spring protests uh, to start shipping in foreign fighters. And there has been an ugly civil war in Syria that's still going on. It has really de-escalated and it becomes it's pretty clear to everybody that the Syrian Arab Republic is not going to fall. And people forget that Syria is a socialist country. It's ruled by the Baathist Arab Socialist Party. Um, Baathism was, uh, it was originally part of the Communist Party, um, the Communist Party of, uh, of Syria. But then when the communists of Syria said to stop fighting the French colonialists uh, during the Second World War, uh, Michel Aflac broke away from the Syrian Communist Party, and he formed his own movement, Baathist Arab Socialism. And Baath is an Arabic word that means rebirth or resurrection or renaissance. Um, and he formed a party that was socialist and drew heavily from Marxism, uh, but applied Marxism to the genius of the Arab people, embraced Islam and Arabism and the traditions of the Arab people. And that's what gave birth to Baathism. It was born in Syria. Um, and you had, you know, Baathist Arab socialism take power in Iraq. And you now today, up to today, you have Baathist Arab socialism in power in Syria. The ruling party of Syria is the Baathist Arab Socialist Party. Uh, but in addition to that, it's a coalition government. Um, you have, in addition to that, you have the Syrian Social Nationalist Party, which is another leftist and socialist party. And in addition to that, you also have the Syrian Communist Party and the Syrian Communist Party, Bakdash. So, uh, you know, the Syrian government is very much a socialist government. Uh, the major centers of economic power, the industries, the banks are run by run by the state. Uh, it emerged from an anti-imperialist, anti-colonial revolution. Um, you know, it's Syria. The Syrian government is the main one of the main backers of the Palestinian resistance against Israel. 
out of the Soviet Union, uh, moved into Syria in the 1980s and built huge power plants. Uh, you know, the, the medical, you know, the number of Syrians who've been trained to become doctors is massive. The medical achievements in Syria in terms of healthcare have been widely praised by the Avincia Medical Journal. And I've written all about this. I've written a lot about Syria and why Syria is a socialist country, uh, very much a socialist country. Um, and emerged from the anti-colonial revolutions that came after the Second World War. Uh, the Communist Party is the two different communist parties are a big part of the government. In addition to that, you also have the ruling party, which is a, a Baathist Arab socialist party. It's got a centrally planned economy. It, its development economically came almost completely because of their alliance with the Soviet Union. Syria is a socialist country. It's absolutely socialist in its and its economic system. I mean, it's not a free market country by any means. The government has five year economic plans since the, you know, since the 1990s, there have been market reforms. It's gotten to be a little bit more like China with free economic zones, but the major industries uh, in Syria um, are heavily, heavily state controlled and centrally planned. And the government in Syria comes out of a popular revolution led by the Baathists and and it's an anti-imperialist country that's tied in with all these socialist and anti-imperialist countries in the world, Cuba, Venezuela. There's Venezuelan military people who have fought in Syria, have gone to fight in Syria. Um, you know, there's communist militias that back up the government. It's very much, very much a socialist society. Um, you know, socialism in our time is very limited because it's surrounded by the imperialists and you know, and under a threat and under attack, but Syria is definitely a socialist country. Um, and so that's why I found it very interesting. You know, the Syrian president, Bashar Assad, now he is an Alawite. And in Syria, you know, the majority, the overwhelming majority of the population are Sunni Muslims. But Bashar Assad is from the Alawite tradition. And Alawitism is a, a very obscure wing of Shia uh, Islam. And they follow Imam Ali, uh, who was, you know, they, they recognize imams coming after the prophet Muhammad. And the Alawites or the Alawis, uh, they are a sect. Uh, they're a very small Islamic grouping that is technically part of the Shia tradition. They don't, they're, they're not like, like they are in Iran. In Iran, they're 12 or Shia. They, admire, they, they recognize 12 imams coming after the prophet Muhammad. The Alawites recognize only one who is Imam Ali. Um, but the Alawites function as a secret society. Uh, they do not pray in mosques uh, because the Imam Ali was stabbed to death in a mosque. Um, you know, their their religious practices are very secretive. Um, they have prayer rooms in their houses um, and it's almost kind of organized in a uh, in a. Um, what you might call a, uh, a Gnostic way, um, you know, as that it's only the men who practice Alawitism uh, the, and they, they learn about it. It's kind of secret tradition that's been passed on. Uh, other Muslims have persecuted uh, Alawites historically. It is, it is considered one of the sects. And uh, because the Alawites were very prominent in the military, the French kind of gave military training to the Alawites. They were prominent in the, the patriotic officer revolts that led to the establishment of the Syrian Arab Republic. Many of the high ranking leaders of the Baathist Arab Socialist Party are from the Alawite tradition. They're religiously Alawites uh, because of that history. And Bashar Assad is an Alawite. However, Bashar Assad's wife, um, you know, and she is a Sunni. And after the 2011, you know, Arab Spring protests, you know, the, the, about 80 percent of the Syrian population are Sunni Muslims. Uh, they actually enshrined Sunni Islam into the constitution. They said that even though Syria is a country of separation of, of religion and state, uh, they did recognize that Sunni Islam has a, a very important place in the Syrian country, and they gave it special recognition. And Bashar Assad's wife is a Sunni, and she practices Sunni Islam. And, you know, the Syrian Arab Republic has, they have really fought. Uh, they have really, really fought, and they have, they have resisted, and they've been through a lot. They've They've, you know, they've had Russia come in and protect them and ISIS fighting against them. Um, you know, they've they've been through a lot, but the Syrian Arab Republic remains standing as a stronghold of anti-imperialism. Um, and that's why I was moved. Uh, and I thought it was of note to see that there was a recent statement by Asma Assad, uh, who is President Bashar Assad, the Syrian president. It's his wife. 
Asma Assad. And so I wanted to highlight um, this recent statement from Asma Assad because it's very, very important what she just said. And so I just dropped the link in the chat. Uh, this is the RT article writing up Asma Assad's recent statement. Here's what she said. I'll read you the article. The first lady of Syria, Asma Assad, visited Moscow this week as her eldest son, Hafez, graduated from Moscow State University. Hafez received a master's degree with honors from the Faculty of Mechanics and Mathematics with Asma attending the ceremony. During her visit, the first lady appeared on RT's Arabic Newsmaker program, speaking about culture ex cultural exchange issues, close ties between Syria and Russia, as well as the challenges that the two countries face. The two nations have been facing similar problems for decades already, both subjected to mounting foreign pressure, as well as attempts at an economic blockade and efforts to establish economic control over them, she said. However, a universal and large-scale challenge for the whole world is the threat of neoliberalism, which is being imposed on all peoples. The main purpose of this, of course, is to blur not only national identity, but very human identity, as well as constituent elements such as patriotism, traditions, and customs, Asma said. Traditional values, for th furthermore, are preserved within the family, which should become a pillar of dialogue between the youth of the whole world, the serious first lady believes. That is specifically the case for, quote, our Eastern societies since it is those societies that are directly threatened and, at the same time, are most capable to withstand this attack due to the culture, morality, and values that they have. The First Lady was also asked about the latest developments in Russia, namely the recent short-lived insurrection by the Wagner Group, PMC, which occurred shortly before her visit. Asma, however, said the affair did not affect her resolve to visit the country altogether. Russian friends supported us without hesitation during the war that was going on in our country. Therefore, we have unhesitatingly supported and will continue to support our friends in the struggles, she stressed. Now, that's a very interesting article. Very, very interesting article. That's the Syrian first lady. She goes to Moscow uh, to watch her son, Hafez, graduate uh, with a degree in mathematics uh, from the Moscow State University. But while she's there, she says that neoliberalism is the biggest threat to the world. A universal and large-scale challenge for the whole world is the threat of neoliberalism, which is being imposed on all peoples. Now, it's very interesting, the language that she used there. But I want to talk about what neoliberalism is. Because that quote, the way she's presenting it, the, the words that she used kind of make it kind of confusing. What is neoliberalism? There's a huge amount of confusion about this. And I, I find it to be a little bit frustrating. But neoliberalism, neoliberalism, and thank you for the super chat, writing it down. Neoliberalism refers to economics. Neoliberalism is a school of economic thought, and it's a set of economic policies that have become popular in Western countries during the 1970s and 80s, and then were imposed onto developing countries during the 1990s. And many people don't realize this. People conflate political liberalism with economic liberalism. And even the way we refer to political liberalism is very confused. So I want to clarify for everyone listening what, what liberalism is, what it actually means, how liberalism, the term is kind of misused in American politics, and then what neoliberalism is. The term liberalism, Liberalism refers to individualism. That's generally what it means. 
But liberalism is the glorification of individualism, of the individual. It is a school of thought, philosophy, politics, economics that emphasizes the individual. That is what liberalism is. It is, it is a school of thought that glorifies the individual. Political liberalism was the ideology that the American Revolution was founded upon life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that John Locke preached in Britain, life, liberty, and property, that the French Revolution was founded upon liberté, égalité, fraternity, the rights of man. That's liberalism. And liberalism has come in many different shapes or forms, and it has really escalated since the 1400s when it originated. Uh, you know, as capitalism was being overthrown, I mean, I'm sorry, as capitalism was emerging and overthrowing feudalism, liberalism became the school of thought that predominated. After the overthrow of feudalism, as capitalism was emerging, you had people come along who started to say things like, human rights exist, individuals have rights, you know, the majority does not have the right to impose onto the minority, um, you know, the right, human beings have basic rights and liberties. Um, and this was kind of the origin of what you can call Western civilization. Uh, coming out of the Dark Ages, you have the Enlightenment, the Renaissance, all of that. As you have the bourgeois revolutions that overturn feudalism, you have the emergence of various thinkers who emerge and say individual rights should be protected. And at the time, that was a very that was a very big thing, right? It was a very good thing, right? The right of individuals, uh, you know, before. Right. In feudalism, you didn't have any rights. Right. If you said that, you know, the Catholic Church was wrong, you got burned at the stake. If you didn't bow to the king. You got your head chopped off. No one had any freedom of speech, any freedom of religion, any freedom of assembly. Um, people's lives were completely controlled by society. However. However. As we emerged from feudalism, gradually people got to have more Freedom and liberalism was the philosophy that preached people should have more freedom. Now, in American politics, we generally refer to liberals as being people that are of the left. We consider the Republican Party to be conservative, and we consider the Democratic Party to be liberals. And that comes out of English politics. Right? In Britain, you had the Conservative Party, which called itself the Tories. They were nicknamed the Tories, but they're still today. They exist. They're called the Conservative Party. They're technically, everyone just calls them the Tories, but they're the Conservative Party. You have them in Canada also, the Conservative Party. The United States, the party that has evolved over time to take on the role of the Conservative Party in America, is called the Republican Party. And in British politics, you had the Tories for a long time. And for a long time, the opposition to the Tories was something called the Liberal Democratic Party or the Liberal Party. And I think it was called the Liberal Party originally. And the Liberal Party was the party that was critical of the Conservative Party uh, and the Tories and the Liberals uh, or the Whigs, the, the Whigs and eventually the Liberal Party. And now now what's what what remains of the Liberal Party is called the Liberal Democratic Party. Um, and that, that, that formation, it comes from Britain. You have the Tories that are the conservatives and you have the, the, the Whigs and eventually the liberals, uh, that emerge that are the opposition and the conservatives want to keep things as is and uphold tradition, uh, and the liberals advocate reforms, uh, and, uh, the conservatives tend to be more free market oriented and the liberals, because they are advocates of reform and the free market is the establishment. They are, they are advocates of more social democracy, more of a welfare state. That's not exactly correct because a welfare state is collectivist. Right? It is. It is collectivist in its, in its understanding, right? I mean, the, that, you know, the idea that you pay taxes and those taxes are imposed on you by society, then they then go to provide food stamps for hungry children or to build roads and bridges. That is not individualism. That is collectivism. So already the way, the way we've come to use the term liberal in America doesn't exactly work. 
and that the term liberal in American political discourse has been kind of watered down and bastardized to mean one who wants to reform and make things better. The conservative says, don't fix it if it ain't broke, keep it the way it is. The liberal says, well, maybe we can have a reform here and we can have a reform there. Um, and it's not exactly liberalism. Liberalism is the glorification of the individual, right? Libertarians in the, in the political and economic sense are the most pure liberals uh, because they glorify individualism above all else in both economics and in politics. They reject any sense. Uh, they reject any sense. They reject any sense. Thank you, Gabby. Uh, good question. They reject any sense of, uh, of, of, you know, the ability of the state or society to impose its morality onto you in your personal life. And they also reject any social control over business. They believe in the total free market. Um, and liberalism as a viewpoint, as, as a school of thought that rap, that views the individuals has been kind of vulgarly presented in American politics to mean advocates of reform. Now in Britain, um, you know, you had the liberals first, the liberal party and the liberal party at one point, uh, they were advocating taxing land values. Henry George, uh, the economist became a well-known liberal thinker. He wanted to you know, basically nationalize land. Um, you know, he had some kind of liberal economic reforms, but as the labor unions got going in Britain, you had the birth of a whole new political party in Britain they call the Labour Party. And the Labour Party calls itself a democratic socialist party, right? So in Britain, socialism is disconnected from liberalism. Uh, in the United States, that is not the case. In the United States, you know, the social democrats, the reformists, the labor movement still is considered to be part of the liberal wing of American politics. Bernie Sanders is a democratic socialist. But in Congress, he is a Democrat. And on Fox News, they call him a liberal. That is what Bernie Sanders is. He is considered to be a liberal. Well, technically, socialism or any, any form of social democracy or a welfare state is not liberal. It's not liberal because you're imposing onto society. Society is imposing on the individual. Um, you know, they're taxing people to pay for those welfare programs. Historically, social democracy has advocated the nationalization of various industries. And so social democracy is not liberalism, but because it is an advocate of reforms, uh, it is it is considered to be liberal. And this is how weird American political discourse is. But when you start talking about economic liberalism, you're talking about a completely different thing. In economics, you generally have Regular, standard, free market, Adam Smith economics calls itself neoclassical economics. It's just standard, you know, people, consumers vote with their dollars. You know, the, 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 you know, the competitive corporations compete to give the best product to the consumers. Uh, you know, supply and demand, prices go up when there's less of something. Prices go down when there's more of something. You know, just your standard laws of the market. Uh, that is what they call neoclassical economics. And those who oppose any reforms and want to stick with classical, neoclassical economics uh, are generally referred to as classical liberals, uh, etc. Neoliberalism. Let me back up. So neoclassical economics, which is Adam Smith, the wealth of nations, free trade, neoclassical economics was the dominant school of economic thought. Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations and argued that the invisible hand of the market uh, produces the best result, uh, that uh, left to its own devices, capitalism will produce the best result, free competition, uh, you know, the best rise to the top, uh, the bad, uh, they sink, and the market guided by the invisible hand of God, produces the ultimate result, um, and that, that, uh, that nations can become wealthy by allowing the market to do its work, and that free trade should dominate global politics. And that was, that was the politics of Adam Smith. Uh, and that's, Adam Smith is largely considered the father of modern 
modern economics, and he's an advocate of what they call neoclassical economics. Um, you know, um, and it's widespread. And you know, this is this is the standard economics that you learn in the university. The free market delivers the best result. Um, obviously, things didn't work out too well. Neoclassical economics says that you just naturally everything works out. Well, pretty soon, economists realized that there was this thing called the boom bust cycle, that every few years you had a glut on the market where there were too many products and people couldn't afford to buy them. And the market crashed uh, and then you had a depression and then the market got going again. And every couple of years, they would have a panic on the stock exchange of London or the stock exchange of New York. The market would be glutted. That's the word they invented for it. Glut, G-L-U-T. Um, you'd have a glut on the market uh, and there would be an economic meltdown and banks would fail and people would lose their jobs. There'd be mass unemployment in the streets. People would be hungry. And then gradually, uh, as people were hungry, uh, the economy would start to get going again. And this was the boom bust cycle that kind of defined the gilded age, they called it. You know, the, the good old days of the free market the Gilded Age, where the economy would melt down every couple of years. There'd be mass hunger and unemployment. People would be starving on the street. These are the days when little children worked in factories. Uh, these are the days where there was no regulation. You know, you know the, the, the medicine men who traveled from town to town and would, you know, sell you snake oil and tell you that it was going to cure you of diseases. This is the days of unregulated capitalism. Uh, you know, the free market just kind of at work where, uh, you know, they just let everything go. Um, and there were obviously big problems with that. Uh, Marxism emerged and it pointed to this problem of gluts as the problem of overproduction. And Marxism said this problem of gluts uh, that frequently happens, uh, it gets worse and worse and worse every time um, because every time technology advances, it makes the problem more exacerbated. Uh, the worker can't buy back what he produces. There's always more products being produced than there are uh, than there are then there are wages being paid out. And because of that, um, you're always going to have gluts on the market. But as technology advances, uh, as technology you know, increases, this problem is going to be exacerbated uh, and it's only going to get worse. And uh, Marxism said that eventually, you know, the worker would rise up and overthrow the capitalist. And then you had the rise of the labor movement, labor unions being formed. And amid all of this, you know, J.P. Morgan and others, they formed the Federal Reserve Bank, which is a bank that is, you know, government. It's a, a you know, a private company that is, you know, facilitated by the government that, that pumps money in and out of the economy in order to stabilize the capitalist economy. Uh, the economists, you know, the, the, you know, the wealthiest people in America met at Jekyll Island and they chartered the Federal Reserve Bank and then Congress approved it. We still have the Federal Reserve. Uh, you know, we have antitrust legislation that makes it, you know, so that corporations can't have an absolute monopoly and forces, forces, you know, corporations to break apart. So there is, there remains competition on the market, or if not, you know, part of, part of the boom bust cycle was monopolization and monopolistic stagnation. Um, you know, we have we have all these problems that arose from from the free market uh, and, you know, the rise of the antitrust legislation that came out. You know, Teddy Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt famously passed all these antitrust laws. Uh, you know, you had the Federal Reserve Bank that was being created. You had attempts to stabilize capitalism uh, as labor unions were emerging and workers were going on strike. Um, but you still had these problems. Now, all of that led to. World War One, which was devastating, and 20 million workers were sent to their deaths on the battlefield of World War One. Um, and World War One was a horrendous event, but it destroyed almost all of Europe and it got the economy going. In the lead up to World War One, you had frequent, you know, economic crises and gluts of overproduction, and you had the British and American and French capitalists rising to dominate the planet. And you had the German capitalists and the Austrian capitalists and the Turkish capitalists kind of forming a block to resist them. And you had this rivalry of who got to dominate. And they were fighting over control of Africa and largely Africa, but they were also fighting for control of Asia and China. They were fighting for control of South America. And the colonial European powers had a rivalry between each other about who should dominate the world. Should it be the German imperialists, the Austrian imperialists, and the Turkish imperialists, or should it be the 
the American imperialists, the French imperialists, and the British imperialists. And this war exploded into Europe and 20 million people died. And it was death on a, a mass scale like people had never seen. There were battles where hundreds of thousands of people died in a single day and a few hours. It was just mass death and destruction that people had never seen. And it rebooted the economy for a time. However, the war itself, you know, with machine guns and all the military, you know, technological innovations caused the problem of overproduction to get going again. You had the roaring 20s, and at least in the United States, the economy was quite strong during the 1920s. And then you had the Great Depression of the 1930s. And in the 1930s, people were starving and hungry on the streets and the communists were organizing and there were communist revolts and uprisings going on. And you had fascism coming to power in Germany and Italy. And eventually you had World War II. And World War II was a much bigger mass episode of death and destruction that destroyed, you know, and took way more lives and killed way more people. I mean, we're talking hundreds of millions of people died in World War II. And out of World War II... That was considered the end of neoclassical economics. Let me repeat this. World War II was considered to be the end of neoclassical economics. After World War II, everyone said this free market stuff is bullshit. World War II was the result of a big, long economic crisis that had happened during the 1930s. And mass death and, I mean, a, a big political crisis and eventually a massive world war and the use of nuclear weapons at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. World War II, World War II had come about, everybody knew, because capitalism doesn't naturally solve the problem. That, you know, that, yeah, they'd had a Federal Reserve, yeah, they'd eventually, at the end of the 1930s in the United States, they created unemployment insurance, and there was a, a, a high level of government control in, in Germany to some degree. The German economy was heavily militarized. But the free market, the free market left to its own devices, wouldn't make sure that everyone had a job, wouldn't feed people. And so out of, out of the Second World War, you get what they call the Keynesian consensus. John Maynard Keynes, was a leading British economist, um, you know, and he was a British Empire, wealthy British anti-communist economist. But John Maynard Keynes had said that capitalism has this problem called underconsumption. He couldn't agree with Karl Marx. Karl Marx had said the problem was overproduction, was that the, you know, the capitalist is always churning out more products than can be sold. Uh, John Maynard Keynes said the problem is underconsumption. Uh, it's not that the capitalist is turning out more products than can be sold. It's that the worker just doesn't have the purchasing power um, and that there was a big debate about this. Um, but John Maynard Keynes argued the problem was what he called underconsumption and that in order to stabilize capitalism, John Maynard Keynes said you have to have the government spend lots of money to stabilize capitalism or else you're just going to have more Great Depressions. And. John Maynard Keynes didn't really specify what the government should spend money on. He didn't really care. He said the government can spend money on anything. John Maynard Keynes' argument was that, uh, you know, the most famous example that is used when articulating and explaining the economic theories of John Maynard Keynes uh, is that, uh, you know, you have you, the government hires a guy to go and dig a hole and they pay a guy to go dig a hole. And then they hire another guy to go fill in the hole. And the conservative says, what a waste of money. But the liberal reformer says, actually, it's kind of a good thing because that guy who got hired to dig the hole, he just got wages. And with those wages, he buys things and the economy gets moving again. And that other guy who they filled, paid to fill in the hole, he also got wages. And that, that you have to have the government spend money to stimulate the economy. The market left to its own devices does not work. That was what John Maynard Keynes said. And after World War II, the consensus was it was that that was universal. And after World War II, because the world had been destroyed in a massive economic crisis, you'd had so much destruction and death, you had the greatest episode of economic expansion in human history. 
It was called the post-World War II economic expansion. After World War II, the global economy boomed everywhere because there was it was time to build. And uh, it boomed in the United States because the United States was the country that hadn't been destroyed. So as all the other countries were rebuilding from the war, they bought their cars and their automobiles and their telephones, and they bought everything from the United States. The United States was selling products to the whole world. And this is when they talk about that American dream. This is when the industrial cities of Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and Cleveland and Milwaukee. And, you know, that's when when the heartland of America flourished because all these cities had factories in them. And the whole world, all the factories on the rest of the planet had been destroyed and people were buying their shit from the United States. The USA was producing steel for the world. Uh, the USA was producing cars for the world. The USA was producing anything. I mean, agricultural goods, everything. The whole world was buying from the United States. That's the 1950s. That's when the United States had rapid economic expansion during the 1950s. And it helped that Roosevelt uh, had built um, at, during these years uh, had built uh, a uh, a huge, huge, um, you know, infrastructure. He built, you know, highways and bridges and, you know, that all laid the foundation. America had scientists and engineers because of the, the mass education and the GI Bill and that that a lot of the Roosevelt infrastructure projects had kind of laid the basis for the USA to take on this, this rapid industrial expansion. And the USA became like the industrial center of the world. So as the world was rebuilding in the United States, the USA was industrial. It was a hugely industrial economy at that point. And there was massive expansion of industry in the 1950s in the United States. In Europe, um, as the countries were rebuilding from the Second World War, the communists had been very popular. You know, in Italy, the communists had led the partisan brigades that had fought the fascists, right? You ever hear the song, Bella Ciao? Soy comunista, toda la vida. Oh, bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 soy comunista, toda la vida, soy comunista. You know, the, the, the Italian Communist Party was wildly popular. And the CIA had this whole program called Operation Gladio to prevent them from winning the elections because they were so popular. In France, the Communist Party was wildly popular because if you've ever heard of La Resistance, La Resistance, right? The resistance to the, 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 to the Nazis, La Resistance. That was the Communist Party. They were the ones fighting, fighting the Nazis. And all over Europe and every European country, the communists were wildly popular. And there was a real fear that the communists would take power. And so in order to steal the thunder of the communists in Western Europe, you had the welfare state. And the welfare state exploded in Britain after World War II. They nationalized almost everything. Railway, steel manufacturing, telecommunications. They nationalized almost everything. And there was almost guaranteed employment. France had almost 100% employment. If you lost your job, the second you lost your job, uh, you know, uh, you lost your job, they, they hired you to paint pictures or they hired you to sweep the streets or, you know, they just hired everybody, right? They just, the government had a job for everybody, um, you know, and they, they created the massive welfare states, national health insurance for everybody. And in many cases, national health care, like government run, government run hospitals for everybody, government run universities, free college for everybody. The welfare state exploded because they didn't want a communist revolution. They wanted to steal the thunder of the communists. The communists had built their reputation during the 1930s, fighting for schools and jobs and decent wages for workers, etc. And then the communists had solidified their good reputation as being anti-fascists. And so in order to not have the communists sweep power, all over Western Europe, France, Italy, Germany, Britain, Norway, Sweden, they just enacted these welfare states. So the government was spending huge amounts of money, giving people health care, giving people jobs, giving people education, giving people anything. Right. I mean, you know, all kinds of stuff. Right. It was just being the government was doing all kinds of stuff. And not only is the government giving people things and with the stuff people are getting from the government, they're then spending money. But on top of that, there's a huge, massive bureaucracy. You know, people are getting hired to work in government jobs. Um, and the welfare state oversaw there was a lot of economic expansion because, you know, a lot of wealth is being redistributed. You had the welfare state. Right. Um, in addition to that. The Soviet Union was rapidly rebuilding with socialist central planning and Eastern Europe had joined with the Soviet Union. 
and in Romania and Czechoslovakia and and Lithuania and Moldova and, and many countries. Uh, you know, you had, you know, new schools being built, roads being paved. I'll never forget, you know, when I was a kid, my family, you know, we hosted a college student from Bulgaria. Right. And he was in his early 20s. He was a college student from Bulgaria. And he wasn't a communist by any means. He didn't believe in communism. But I asked him if anyone in Bulgaria still believed in communism. And I remember he told me, oh, yeah, he said his grandfather believed in communism. And I said, why did his grandfather believe in communism? He said, because his grandfather remembers how after World War II was over, the government hired him to build roads. And he was a young man at the time, like, a, you know, 18, 19 years old. The war had just ended. And all of a sudden, the communists were in power in Bulgaria. And the first thing they did is they mobilized all the young men to go and build the roads of the country and how that was the, the height of his grandfather's life. His grandfather got to travel all through the country with other young men and they built the roads. They paved the roads of the country and they would go from village to village in the mountains, town to town, and everyone would greet them as heroes. And they were working hard for the good of their country and building the roads. And his grandfather said that was the best years of his life is when as a young teenager, he'd put on a communist uniform and worn a communist beret and marched through his own country from one end of the country to the other, building roads, right? And his grandfather, he said his grandfather had been through that and they'd seen the devastation of World War II and now World War II was over and suddenly the communists were in power and his grandfather was building, he was building roads. And he said his grandfather was a true communist till the day he died. And he said Stalin was a great guy and his grandfather was a communist. Well, I had never heard that. You never hear this kind of thing in the United States. People don't tell you this, but the immediate aftermath of the Second World War in the Eastern Bloc was a period of great economic expansion. Romania, Poland, Latvia, I mean, every country, Hungary, all of them, they were just sending these young people, these young people out to build roads, to build new universities. They were training people to be doctors. Women were voting and having roles in the government. And it was it was a huge moment of economic expansion with the Soviet Union sending engineers and scientists to direct a population and just rapidly industrializing their country. No one ever talks about this, but, you know, all across the Eastern Bloc. Meanwhile, China had some of its first industrialization during these years. China built some of its first power plants and its first steel mills during these years. Um, you know, uh, North Korea was industrializing during the 1950s after rebuilding from the Korean War. And that all over the world in the 1950s and the 1960s, you had a huge economic expansion. You had the, the United States was rapidly industrializing because it was the center of, of world industry because it hadn't been destroyed in the war. You had the welfare state in Europe, you know, which was heavy government control over industry and heavy, heavy, you know, social welfare programs. The communist world was, you know, have a socialist central planning. It was rebuilding. And in addition to that, you had the rise of these Bonapartist military regimes in the third world. In the countries that were aligned with the United States, the USA was really afraid that these countries would have communist revolutions. So in Iran, you had the Shah of Iran. It was a dictator. He was the, the king, right? You know, they overthrew the democratically elected leader, Mossadegh. They overthrew him, um, you know, and they replaced him with the Shah, right? The hereditary king. And Mossadegh, the king of Iran, he, you know, was was, you know, he was like a military dictator of Iran, but he he had what he called the white revolution. He redistributed land. He built an airline, Iran's first airlines and Iran's first railway systems. And, you know, he did a lot for Iran because, the you know, if it wasn't, you know, if, if he didn't do that, he was going to be overthrown. Uh, eventually, you had Park Chung-hee come to power in South Korea. He did similar things. You have the Asian tiger countries, uh, you know, emerging and that that that. In the third world, you had the communists in various places industrializing, and then you had U.S.-backed Bonapartist military strongmen who were vicious. Would you know if you disagreed with the Shah, or if you were known to be sympathizing with communists, you were disappeared and never heard from again, or tortured and horrendously treated. But they industrialized, and the Keynesian consensus, they called it, where it was just assumed that the free market does not work that you have to, you absolutely just have to, you have to have the government spend lots of money to stabilize the economy. The Keynesian consensus defined economics in the 50s and 60s and into the early 70s. Um, and that was, that was the feeling. And in the United States, Keynesianism primarily came in the form of, of 
the military industrial complex. The U.S. government spent a huge amount of money on militarism, bombs, tanks, and weapons, uh, you know, and that they just, you know, the USA became the world's weapons factory. The USA was sending weapons all over the world. The NATO countries were all required to buy military hardware from the United States. And the, the USA, the way that they kept the economy stable was the government spent huge amounts of money on bombs and tanks and weapons. The welfare state in America has always been very limited. We do not have national health care in America, right? Uh, we do not have we do not have guaranteed employment. You know, the government doesn't hire unemployed people for the most part. Uh, you know, we don't have free college. We have a very limited welfare state in America. The Keynesianism of the United States has largely come in the form of the government spending lots of money on weapons. Uh, they call it military Keynesianism. So much so that when Dwight Eisenhower left office, uh, you know, as he was leaving office, he talked about the danger of undue influence from the military industrial complex, um, you know, because it was just it was so influential and growing. Um, it's, it's very wild. So. So that was that was the Keynesian consensus. Neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is a school of economic thought that emerged as a result of people starting to move away from the Keynesian consensus. You had the Mont Perlin Society and the Austrian school. You had Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich von Hayek. And then you had the rise of Milton Friedman, Ayn Rand, Alan Greenspan. And it was during the 1970s as we started to see major economic downturns. 1972, there was a big economic downturn. 1978, there was a very dramatic economic downturn. You got a narrative being pushed that the reason for the economic downturn was the, the government is spending too much money. We're not letting the free market do its work. And you had Ayn Rand and Milton Friedman. Those were the two main voices in the United States uh, that were made, used to popularize neoliberal economics. Now, Ayn Rand is not an economist. Uh, Ayn Rand was, you know, a Hollywood, Hollywood screenwriter who wrote novels and started her own philosophy. And she had fled the Soviet Union. She was a friendly witness to the House Un-American Activities Committee. Ayn Rand was, you know, that's what Ayn Rand was. She was a, I don't know what you want to call her. She was, she was a writer. Uh, Milton Friedman was an academic economist. Uh, but the two of them were being widely pushed during the 1970s. Ted Turner, who was considered the founder of CNN, a billionaire, uh, he took out billboards all over the United States promoting Ayn Rand, who is John Galt, Galt et cetera. Uh, you know, objectivism and the Ayn Rand, you know, writings in the 1960s and then especially in the 1970s, they started really pushing Atlas Shrugged and the Fountainhead and, you know, this, this kind of stuff started getting really pushed very, very hard. Um, and neoliberal economics was essentially a movement of enacting economic reforms to take apart the welfare state. That's what neoliberalism is. Neoliberalism is taking apart the welfare state. That's the essence of what neoliberal economics is. It is saying that we need to repudiate the Keynesian consensus and that it's always better if the market does it. That is neoliberal neoliberalism. It's not it's not going back to Adam Smith, but it is repudiating the Keynesian consensus. And it is reducing government spending. And that's the main thing. It is reducing government spending. And many people have essentially argued that neoliberalism is the ideology of austerity. 
When people say austerity, that's when you're being austere, you're reducing spending. It is the ideology that says when you have an economic crisis, the response to it, the way you resolve it, is you cut spending on the part of the government. That's what neoliberalism is. And neoliberalism is largely predicated on the notion that, I mean, I'll, I guess I'll put it more crudely in a minute, but the notion, the idea is that, okay, you just had an economic crisis, some banks failed, a lot of people lost their jobs. How do we solve it? Well, we, we cut government programs, we lay off government workers, and then the tax burden on the population goes down. People have more money to spend and they open more businesses and the market gets going again. So to put it more crudely, neoliberalism is a school of thought that says you can cut your way into economic growth. That is what neoliberalism argues, that one can cut their way into economic growth. The problem is that most very, very wealthy people only spend their huge amounts of money if they can make a profit on it. You and I spend money for pleasure. Right? Think about it, right? I mean, you know, you, you know, I went to the movies with my wife yesterday. That was for pleasure, right? It wasn't a very good movie. Right? We didn't have as much pleasure as we hoped, but you know, we, you know, you know, we spend money for pleasure. We spend money for necessities, for rent, for food, etc. But if you have millions and billions of dollars, that's more than you can spend for pleasure. And so, if you have billions and billions of dollars, if you have a golden hoard. You have no reason to spend it unless you can get a return on your investment. Um, and if you can get a return on your investment, then you'll invest it because you're going to turn more money. Once you have, once you're part of the ruling class, once you're a millionaire or a billionaire, most of the money you have gets spent in no other way than trying to make more money, than investing. And because of inflation, it gradually loses value over time. The longer your money just sits there, it loses value gradually because of inflation. And so if you, if you reduce the tax burden on the very, very wealthy, all that does is make their golden hoard sit there. It just sits there, right? They're not going to invest it unless they can get a return on their investment. And that is a flaw, a flaw in neoliberal economics. The notion, well, we, we'll just make everyone's taxes go down. Not necessarily. Until the economy gets going, that money is staying in the bank, right? You, you know, I mean, people don't just invest of their own free will. You have to get the economy going again. Um, you cannot cut your way out of an economic crisis. There has never been an economic crisis in history that has ever been resolved by the government cutting spending. It just doesn't happen. But, and this is the weird thing, the reason neoliberal economics has caught on is because when there's an economic meltdown, people are convinced of the need to cut spending because they say, look, there's so little money. Oh, we're out of money. Everyone's, at, we just don't have the money for this anymore. Right. It's like they, they think of they think of it almost like, you know, like the government, like we're one big household. And right? this is the way neoliberal economics is presented. Like the country is just one big household. And let's say, you know, you know, both of the parents are working in the household and uh, one of the parents loses their job. Well, the family might then have to stop reduce its spending. Neoliberal economics wants you to think that the country is just one big household. And when the economy crashes. Well, one of the parents lost their job, so now we just have to cut our expenses. We can't, you know, spend as much money on things as we used to. But it's not like that. It's not like that at all. A country is not a household. And an economic crash is not a situation where, you know, one of the parents lost their job. It's much more complex than that. And, you know, the wealth of the country 
isn't largely coming from outside. It's coming from within, right? And the tax revenue, et cetera. And that neoliberal economics, it's very effective because when the economy crashes, they then go and they say, wow, the economy just crashed. We can't afford schools anymore. We have to cut food stamps. We have to cut. We have to cut. It's very, it's a persuasive time to cut. It convinces people we just can't afford this anymore. But it doesn't resolve the economic crisis. Now, also, and this is this is to be fair, neoliberal economics is separate from Austrian school economics. Austrian school economics is utopian capitalism, right? You know, neoliberalism is to communism. Neoliberalism is to Austrian school what social democracy is to communism. Neoliberalism says we gradually get the government out and we gradually move toward the free market. The Austrian school says we have to have a completely unregulated capitalism, no federal reserve. We have to go back to the gold standard. We have to privatize everything. You know, Austrian school economics is anarcho-capitalism. It is, it is libertarian free market insanity. Whereas neoliberalism is real policies that have been enacted, policies that I would argue are very harmful, very harmful policies, but they are indeed policies that have been enacted. Neoliberalism is school choice, charter schools, schools for profit, where private companies are hired and they're paid per student for education. Neoliberalism is private prisons, prisons for profit. Right, where a private corporation gets hired and paid for every person who gets locked up, uh, you know, and, and for every prisoner, the, they get paid a certain amount of money and they imprison them uh, for profit. All right. It's uh, private military contractors, private military corporations. That's what neoliberal economics is. It is policies where they're transitioning away from state control and state ownership and taking things that are generally done by the state, like education, like the military, like prisons, and they're gradually relegating them to private corporations. And often, like libertarians, Austrian school kind of people are very critical of neoliberal economic policies because they see it as, quote unquote, crony capitalism. However, if you ask Austrian school people what the solution is, they want to they want to just completely privatize absolutely everything, which is never going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Right. Um, so it's a little bit weird, but they they do understand that schools for profit, private prisons, they see that all as corrupt. Right. They, they see it all as crony capitalism. They see it all as as the government picking winners and losers, assigning contracts to their cronies. They're critical of it, but their solution, they have this unworkable solution that, you know, I mean, just just completely destroy the government and have a total free market, which is never going to happen. Um, that's never, never going to happen. So, you know, I, I mean, that's the Austrian school. Um, and this is all this is all important to talk about when we're talking about neoliberalism. Now, the reason that Asma Assad. The reason that she's saying that neoliberalism is the biggest threat to humanity is because neoliberal economics is not honest in its intention. Neoliberal economics is not honest in its intention. Neoliberal economics says, well, we're going to reduce the, the role of the government in the economy. And in doing so, we're going to free up the market and create economic growth. That has never happened, ever. And neoliberal economists know this. Milton Friedman, Ayn Rand, people like that, Alan Greenspan, they're the front men. Their job is to come out there and say that's what they're doing. The reality is that neoliberal economics is a form of Malthusianism. Let me repeat that. Neoliberal economics is a form of Malthusianism. It is about reducing consumption and killing poor people in order to save capitalism, 
It's the way to avoid economic crises is to reduce overpopulation and overconsumption. This is Malthusianism. They argue, they believe that the problems in the economy are because working class people have too many children and working class people have too comfortable of a lifestyle. And that in reality, they want to carry out depopulation to save capitalism. It is essentially a form of degrowth. That's what neoliberal economics really is when you get down to it. It is a form of degrowth. After the fall of the Soviet Union, they went into the Eastern Bloc and they privatized everything and they bought up state factories and closed them down and they degrew the economy of Russia. Uh, they just completely cut off the means of life for millions of people and the population of Russia decreased by 10%. Uh, you know, if you look at, this is a fact, the, the, the economy of Russia reduced by 10% during this period. And, you know, Naomi Klein talks about this in her book, The Shock Doctrine. Philip Thayer talks about it in his uh, book, uh, which is Europe since 1989. Both of those are right over there on my shelf. That, that it's about reducing consumption and they, they drive down the population, they drive down consumption. Andre Gunder Frank, the U.S. economist, referred to the period uh, of, of the 1990s in Russia as economic genocide. And they were doing this all across, uh, all across Latin America during this period as well. They started with Pinochet uh, in Chile uh, and they, they, you know, neoliberalism was going across South and Central America where they, they cut government subsidies in the name of privatizations. But what they're actually doing is they're just killing people. They're degrowing the population. They're making it impossible for people to survive. Uh, and as a result, they're making it possible for, impossible for people to consume. If people don't have jobs. If people are hungry out on the street, they're not consuming. They're reducing consumption to try and stabilize a capitalist economy. And it is a, it is a form of Malthusianism. It is a form of Malthusianism, but it is, I guess you could call it soft Malthusianism in the sense that the government is not killing people and the government is not forcibly reducing consumption. It is just pulling the carpet out from under people, right? You, you know, you are working in a business that gets a government subsidy, get rid of that subsidy. You are a government employee, get rid of it. Oh, you get food stamps, get rid of your food stamps. It's soft Malthusianism. It's degrowth, but it is degrowth by reducing the public budget. And um, that's really what neoliberal economics is. It is degrowth. It is degrowth justified with pop economics, junk economics, right? Most academic economists will tell you that Milton Friedman is full of shit. But Milton Friedman wasn't made for academic economists. Milton Friedman was made for PBS, right? They had a mini series on PBS, free to choose. And it was just night after night, Milton Friedman paid for it, brought to you by the American government, telling you why we needed to cut off government spending. Um, you know, um, uh, you know, you know, Ayn Rand had did not have an economics degree. She wasn't an economist, but she wrote books about how we have to have the government out of the economy and the, you know, the, the creative, hardworking people get suppressed and the rich are great because they invented things and they're creative, blah, 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 blah. And that, that the first wave of degrowth, the 70s and 80s, and especially in the 90s after the fall of the Soviet Union, came in the form of the neoconservatives pushing neoliberal economics and destroying and eroding the welfare state. And in the United States, they got rid of the welfare state. They reduced the welfare state. In Europe, they rolled back the welfare state. Uh, and in the third world, they overthrew. They, the neocons had them violently overthrow governments like the government of Iraq or the government of Panama or the government of, the government of Grenada, the governments that were standing in the way of, of free market reforms and governments that were trying to raise their people up and you know, they, they forcibly degrew countries by toppling their revolutionary or anti-imperialist government. And that was what we saw. You know, that was just kind of as the fall of the Soviet Union happened. The fall of the Soviet Union happened. You had the, you know, the boom of the 90s, the dot-com boom. And, you know, you had this, this wave of 
neoliberalism that neoconservatives were pushing, you know, with neoconservative politics, Ronald Reagan, et cetera. They were rolling back the welfare state and they were they were destabilizing and overthrowing countries that that believed in state control, of the means of production or believed in the government stimulating economic growth. They were spreading degrowth across the planet, but with neoliberal economic reforms. And that is what Asma Assad is talking about, because Syria has long been a target of that. The Syrian Arab Republic came into being as the result of a popular anti-imperialist, anti-colonial revolution. And the Syrian Arab Republic builds shit. You know, they build things. Uh, they build huge dams. They, you know, they, they did a lot to wipe out illiteracy, to bring education to the population. You know, they, they have been a barrier to neoliberal economics spreading around the world. And, you know, that's why they've been a target for regime change. You remember after the USA overthrew the government of Iraq and drove Iraq into chaos, right afterwards, you remember they said, oh, well, the weapons of mass destruction weren't there. They just gave them to Syria. Now Syria has them. Well, no, Syria didn't have them. There were no weapons of mass destruction. But why did they say that? Because Syria is an anti-imperialist, Baathist Arab socialist government that's on the list, right? That's a target, um, right? And that neoliberalism and the neoconservative regime change operations walked hand in hand. But I would argue that we're now entering phase two of all of this. That what we're seeing with BlackRock and what we're seeing with Biden and the liberals, this is beyond neoliberal economics. This is state-controlled degrowth, right? Neoliberal economics says just cut all the government subsidies, privatize government services. It's Malthusian, but at the same time, it is kind of a hands-off approach. What Joe Biden is doing and what the British Empire is doing right now, what the World Economic Forum did during the pandemic with the lockdowns, what Greta Thunberg is pushing for in the name of climate change, this is an attempt, this is more fascism. This is the state coming in and BlackRock, in order for a company to get your loan, you have to comply with, with their eco-regulations. Uh, you know, you have to adopt these things. And it is it is fascist degrowth. It's state-controlled degrowth where they're coming in uh, and the government is coming in and saying, you must lock down. The government is coming in and saying, you must not build a coal power plant. You must build windmills instead. The government is coming in and forcing degrowth with its governing power. And that is different than neoliberal economics. Neoliberalism was about reducing the role of government Meanwhile, neo, whatever we're living under right now, you know, this, this new thing, wokeism, I guess you can call it, woke fascism is about imposing degrowth, right? It is regulating degrowth rather than simply degrowing by means of austerity. It is amplifying what is the agenda has always been the agenda behind neoliberalism. And that is why the libertarian element is playing a different role. Libertarians have just kind of been the foot soldiers of degrowth, right? They've been promoting austerity, right? Get the government off our backs. But now that degrowth isn't just coming in the subtle form of austerity and stripping away the welfare state, but now that degrowth is coming in the form of the government forcing degrowth, forcing the lockdown, forcing the reduction of consumption, forcing countries not to build power plants. Now, the libertarian element tends to attract people who believe in growth. They believe in economic growth. They're not just whining about the size of the government. They're complaining that the government is actively crushing small business owners, actively crushing people's innovation. And the libertarian element is suddenly it's a, it's 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 becoming not an element that's cheering for economic degrowth but rather an element that is pushing growth and sees the fascistic woke government crushing growth and that changes the nature of politics however pretty soon the lower levels of capital 
and the small business owners and the working class are all going to have to unite not to get the government out, but rather they're going to say the only way we can fight this powerful government of the oligarchy that's forcibly degrowing us is we have to have a fist of our own. We have to have a government of action to punch back. Right. And that is going to be the beginning of the anti monopoly coalition that is needed to get us out of the crisis. Libertarians are people that are resisting the fascistic forced degrowth, the lockdowns, the reduction of consumption the growing confrontation with Russia and China, the opposition to energy, they're resisting that. But they have the illusion that they can somehow get to a situation where we can all just agree that the government doesn't get involved. But eventually, you know, the rise of Donald Trump is a sign but the lower levels of capital are already starting to realize that that's not going to cut it. That's not going to cut it. You want to resist degrowth. You cannot do it simply by having a total free market. Instead, you need a powerful government that's on your side against the oligarchs. You need a government of action to fight for working families. You need Hugo Chavez. You need Huey Long. You need Fidel Castro. You need, you need a strong government to fight for the working class. You need socialism with Chinese characteristics. You need Mao creating a block of four great classes to push the imperialists out of China so that China can grow again. Now, what libertarians want is not achievable with the policies that they advocate. They believe that you can somehow just convince everyone to be a libertarian and then the government will stay out and the market will work. And they're wrong. They're wrong because until you have a government of action to beat back the oligarchs, to control the means of production, to stabilize the market, to allow growth to innovate, to subsidize small business owners. To I mean, until you have public ownership of the means of production, you're not going to be able to get out of a situation where the oligarchy can rig everything in its favor. And so Austrian economics and libertarianism is not a solution in this time, but it is the ideology of people that are on the right side of the contradiction. Most so-called leftists at this point have completely, completely degenerated into nothing but being the foot soldiers of degrowth. They believe in the lockdowns. They believe in reducing consumption to save the planet. They believe in allowing the government to silence anyone who disagrees. They hate Russia and China and want to escalate tensions against them. That is what most leftists, so-called leftists, have degenerated into. They have they are, Leftism has deteriorated into a wrecker cult and to a group of people that, you know, they're angry at rich people, they're angry at white people, they're angry at men, they're angry at non-LGBT people, they're angry at... at I don't know, skinny people, physically fit people. They're, I don't, they're angry at a lot of people that they perceive as having life better than them. And they want to burn everything down and tear it down and enact vengeance against them. And they, I've seen some of them even wear guillotines around their necklaces, around their necks and necklaces. They worship the guillotine. The Paris Commune of 1871, one of the first things it did was burn the guillotine because the guillotine was a symbol of terror uh, and political repression. And, you know, when the communards of Paris seized power, they burned the guillotine. But, you know, a lot of these, some of these, you know, DSA kind of people, they just wear guillotines around their neck. They are, they are a destruction movement. They are a movement that wants to destroy things. Um, they want to destroy things. And whether they realize it or not, they're simply foot soldiers of degrowth Malthusianism to save capitalism. 
Whereas around the world, socialism has matured quite a bit. And in the process of the 20th century, now the 21st century, in China, in, in Venezuela, in, in Vietnam, socialism is a, a government that controls the means of production, but allows the market and facilitates the market in addition to that in order to oversee growth. Socialism is, is the city building tendency. And Trotskyism, Trotskyism is that, you know, is that that vandal tendency, that that destructive guillotine cult. That's that's when it separated. Stalin was the father of the five year plans. He industrialized Russia. He, he built Russia into a modern country. He defeated the Nazi invaders. He brought back the Russian Orthodox Church. Stalin, he pushed socialism in one country. He made Russia an economic superpower. He improved millions of people's lives. And he then enabled, you know, a process that led to anti-colonial revolutions all across the planet and, you know, enabled Libya to become, you know, the highest uh, life expectancy on the African continent, build the great man-made river, enabled China to launch on the course of becoming what it is today, et cetera. Stalin, Stalin's socialism was a socialism that had exorcised the Trotskyite element. Trotsky believed in the permanent revolution. And the permanent revolution was just this destructive libidinal Oedipal impulse. Um, you know, the desire to destroy things. Trotsky held on to the guillotine cult. Uh, the guillotine, the guillotine, the right of the guillotine, the, 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 the worshippers of the guillotine. That's what Trotsky held on to. Trotsky was loyal to the European revolutionary intelligentsia and not to the broad masses of people. Whereas Stalin took socialism and made it a populist constructive movement. And socialism with Chinese characteristics, Deng Xiaoping theory, the socialist oriented market economy of Vietnam, Bolivarianism in South and Central America, Christianity, socialism and solidarity, in Nicaragua, Fidelismo, all of these things are variants of, you know, and they, they don't all practice the policies of Stalin, but they come out of Stalinism, right? They come out of Stalin's repudiation of Trotskyism, repudiation of the permanent revolution. They came out of really existing socialism and the existing socialist countries of the third world. Baathist Arab socialism comes out of this, um, you know, even, even, Various anti-capitalist movements in the third world, like the Islamic Revolution of Iran, you know, yes, they repudiate Marxism. Yes, they denounced the Soviet Union and said neither East nor West, but they still had a construction jihad. They still mobilized the population to build, and they still very much draw from that Stalinist way of doing things, that mobilizing the population, that appear appealing to a spiritual power among the people and sending them out to build. What I talked about, that, you know, that friend of mine, you know, uh, that that student we hosted from Bulgaria, whose grandfather remembers the best moments of his life were when he was sent out to build roads in Bulgaria. That's Stalinism, right? That's Stalin, right? That's the anti-capitalism. And that's heavily Marxist. That draws heavily from Marx. It draws from Marx's understanding of overproduction. It draws from Marx's understanding that we need the state to control the means of production, that we're trying to get to a world of so much wealth and abundance that we can reach that ultimate stage of communism, a stateless, classless world. You know, that that doesn't completely chuck Marxism, but it chucks it chucks the Oedipal destructive impulses that Marxism was attached to. It, it chucks Trotsky. It chucks the revolutionary intelligentsia. It, it chucks uh, La Boheme. Right. It chucks uh, it chucks the lumpen element. Right. And it makes Marxism into an ideology or a vehicle for creating a government that oversees economic growth. And and that is the Marxism that exists around the world. It is the city building tendency. Right. Um, and that is that is what the Center for Political Innovation celebrates. We are the city building tendency. Right. And we have attached ourselves to the global anti-imperialist camp, Russia, China, Venezuela, Iran. But we understand that when the city building tendency comes to America, it will be uniquely American. It will be a socialism that is designed specifically to meet the American people's needs, to address the problems of U.S. society. It will be a uniquely American socialism. 
and it will be about building and constructing and we'll mobilize the population to go out and build and construct. We'll, we'll cultivate a spirit of community and working together. That's what socialism with American characteristics will be like, right? It'll be an optimistic, constructive socialism. And it'll be a repudiation of neoliberal economics, of the synthetic left, and of degrowth, and of the Malthusian schemes of the ultra-rich. It'll be the human species saying that growth is good, and our will to construct will assert itself. That's what the city-building tendency is, and that's when the city-building tendency comes to power. That's what it will look like. Um... And right now, we need to construct the anti-monopoly coalition. We need to unite with all the forces who want to build and all the forces that want peace with the anti-imperialist camp and see the anti-imperialist camp, Russia and China, the BRICS, Bolivarianism, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, see them as the future. That's what we need to do. That is what we need to do. And this is what I'm trying to get you to understand. And so I basically used... Asma Assad's statement about fighting neoliberalism to get you to understand economics, to get you to understand the psychology of revolution, to get you to understand what the Center for Political Innovation is all about. We have a four point economic plan. We call for public uh, mass mobilization of the public to rebuild the country. We call for public ownership of oil and gas and natural resources. We call for public control of the banking sector, and we call for an economic bill of rights. And we will work with anyone who agrees with those four planks. You know, we don't care if you're pro-transgender or critical of the transgender issue. We don't care if you're a Christian, a Muslim, a Jew, a Hindu, an atheist. We don't care. We will mobilize with anyone who agrees with our four-point economic plan to save the country. That is what we believe in. We are the city-building tendency. Um, And we seek to cultivate a network of people that are opposed to these wars, opposed to the emerging low-wage police state and the degrowth agenda of the ultra-rich. And that is what we intend to do. We intend to work with anyone who agrees with those four points. And we want to build a network of people in real life activists who've worked with each other, who can rely on each other, right, Um, to work together to achieve these aims. And that is what the Center for Political Innovation is all about. And I hope that this live stream, uh, you know, we've been here for about an hour and a half. I hope that this is helpful in explaining all of this. Um, So... There you go. Um, And I guess um, at this point, I will open it up for the roll call. Names and locations, names and locations. I will call you all out as I see you. Names and locations, names and locations. Who is with us tonight? Who is with us tonight? Names and locations, names and locations. Who's with us tonight? Names and locations. Who is with us? We got Mark in Utica, New York. Welcome, 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 Mark. Glad to have you with us. We got John Witte in Houston. Welcome, 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 John Witte. Glad to have you with us tonight. All right. We got Gabby in Chicago. We got Sherry in New Jersey. We got Ryan in Kansas City. We got Chris in Salt Lake City. Patrick in Maine. St. David's Bermuda. Simon Miller from Missouri. Shout out to you. Colin in Greensboro. Heidi in Edinburgh. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Steve in Boston, Sydney in Australia, Edwin in the Philippines. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Sarah in Toronto, Auckland, New Zealand, Joshua in St. Louis area. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Alex from Brazil, Peter in South America, somewhere between Langley and the Pentagon. Bum, bum, bum. We love you, Johnny Blaze. Johnny Blaze, right? We got Southern Haley from Singapore. We got Maxim. All right. Rise from Adelaide, Australia. Bob Troy in New York. Uh, Masking in Vancouver. Alan Rice from South Korea. Micah in Las Vegas. We got Briggy Smalls in Pennsylvania. Welcome, Briggy. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We got Bendigo, Australia. David Fox. Temple City, California. Reza, Iran. Reza from Iran. We got a great bunch of folks here. Names and locations, folks. Names and locations. I will call you all out as I see you. Names and locations. Names and locations. Who is with us tonight? Names 
and location. It's the second day of July, and it is certainly hot here in New York City, but there you go. Uh, you know, it's better than being cold. I like it when it's hot. It's better than being cold. Uh, NJ from Baltimore. Adam from Las Vegas. You know, I had a roommate years ago. You know, he's watching. He knows who he is. Not saying your name, buddy. But one thing that always annoyed me about this roommate uh, is that I, I had this conversation with him on many occasions. Many, many occasions. Oh, Ypsilanti. That's in Michigan. Wow. Uh, Albuquerque. Um, many occasions when it was cold outside, he would say to me, oh, my God, Caleb, it's so cold. I never complain about hot weather. I, I'd rather it be cold than be hot. And then it would be summertime. And I would say to this, this roommate would say the exact same thing to me. He would say, he would say, oh my God, Caleb, it's so hot outside. I'd rather it be cold. I, I, it never gets, it never gets um, too hot. Or no, no, I'm sorry. Let me start again. When it was too cold outside, he would insist he loved hot weather. And it could never get too hot. He preferred it to be cold. When it was cold outside, he would insist it could never get too hot. He loved hot weather. In the wintertime, he loved hot weather. And in the summertime, he loved cold weather. And I would remind him on both occasions. In the summertime, he would be saying he was longing for winter. And I'd be like, dude, you, you just told me six months ago that it could never get too hot. I mean, it never could get too cold. And he just, he couldn't make up his mind. You know, I am pride myself on being consistent. It's hot right now. You know, don't have an air conditioner in this room. You know, is it hot? Yes. Now, is hot better than cold? Absolutely, it's better than cold. Cold weather is far worse than hot weather. But this guy I lived with, he had no memory, right? He didn't have a long-term memory. Right. He was aware of what he was feeling at the time. But he was not aware of his feelings in the long term uh, and that that this is a kind of childishness. Right. Someone says flip flopping is childish. You are correct. Um, and that if you really want to be healthy and this is very weird. Right. But if you really want to be psychologically healthy, you have to learn to live in the past, the present and the future at the same time which is impossible. But if you really want to be able to be all there and think strategically and and think rationally, you have to be able to remember how you felt yesterday. You have to be aware of how you feel now. And you have to be thinking about what might happen tomorrow, right? In order to have your brain firing on all, cil uh, on all cylinders, you have to, to some degree or other, maintain enough of a distance or an observer, I think some psychologists call it an observer, to be aware of how you felt yesterday and how you felt you might feel tomorrow while at the same time being aware of how you feel in the moment. Right? And, and this is a skill that is very difficult. I know there was a psychological test they once did where they, they took little children and they gave them a marshmallow. And they said, if you eat this marshmallow, you can have it. But if you wait until the end of the day, you can get an extra marshmallow. You can have two marshmallows. Very interesting. And they just did this. And some kids, they just ate the marshmallow right then. But some kids waited until the end of the day and got two marshmallows. And that they, they saw that that the kids who waited until the end of the day and got two marshmallows, they, that was a huge, huge predictor of success in life. Huge predictor of success. Um, the ability to delay gratification, because those kids could live not just in the moment where they wanted that marshmallow, but could hold off they had the discipline, the self-discipline to hold off and wait till the end of the day for two marshmallows. They were much more successful human beings in the long term. Um, it's not just about instant gratification. Instant gratification is part of it, but, but the issue with instant, it's not just instant gratification. It's the ability to not be completely living in the moment. 
if you're just living in the moment. If you're just living in the moment, you're going to eat that marshmallow. But if you're living in the past, you remember how good two marshmallows were the last time you had them. You're living in the present where you realize you've just been told this. And you're and, and then you're also living in the future, which is I might get two marshmallows. You're able to you're able to make that calculated decision. Right. Um, you know, um, you know, um, you know, uh, it's pretty wild, isn't it? Uh, it's pretty wild. Um, you have to be able to live in the past and the present and the future at the same time. I'm sorry, I cannot, well, this super chat makes me smile. It really makes me smile. That's all I'm going to say about that right now. I don't know who you are, Mr. Barp, but I do appreciate that, right? Because I, uh, you know, uh, among leftists, my reputation has been run through the mud. So the fact that someone who actually knew me, who is somewhat of a prominent leftist academic, uh, speaks of me in such terms, that makes me smile, Mr. Barp. Um, I'm not going to comment more on that at this time. Uh, but yes, I did study under Mark Matern, and the fact that he remembers me in such terms speaks to my credit. Uh, Dr. Matern is not where I'm at politically. Uh, you know, he's a DSA kind of guy. But the fact that he, you know, would say such a thing that that repudiates largely what is what is said about me by other people of his political persuasion. So I I really do appreciate hearing that, Mr. Barp. Um, so shout out to Mr. Matern, wherever he is. I'm sure he doesn't agree with a lot of what I say. And, you know, that's fine. But I, I do appreciate I do appreciate hearing that, Mr. Barp. All right. Um, but anyhow, I do need to answer super chat questions. Um, I do want to let people know that the second half of our show is defined by super chat questions. I only have two of them so far. They're good super chats, um, and I will answer them. But this, at this time, I would urge, I would urge you all uh, to please send me more super chats because that'll give me something more to talk about. Uh, so please think about, you know, what you'd like me to talk about. Send me more super chats. I've only got two here, and I can keep going for a while here, right? Not in a rush to get any place, you know. Um, we're we're trudging right along here. Before I start answering super chat questions, I will say uh, that I do want to remind you all that um, that we are having on July 10th two New York City events. The first one is a protest. Good Lord, is a protest that is happening at 3 p.m. Peace with Russia, peace with China, no police state. That is happening at 3 p.m in New York City, assembling at 43rd and 6th Avenue in New York City. Uh, it's going to be great. Um, and then after that, after our little protest, you know, well, I don't expect it to be huge, but our, we're going to have a demonstration. After our demonstration, then we will have an evening event pretty close by in the same general area. And it's going to have a lot of guest speakers. You know, and that evening event, Jose Vega, Chris Halali, Nick Brana, and our special guest attorneys, who we're not putting their names out there, but they'll be there. We're going to have a couple rather prominent attorneys speaking at our event, well-known attorneys who will speak about the legal system and, and a book about the legal system that, that we've chosen to highlight. Um, and that will be, um, that'll be at 4 uh, West 43rd Street starting at 7 p.m. So if you're anywhere near New York City, if you're in New Jersey, if you're in upstate New York, if you're in you know, Vermont, New Hampshire, Connecticut, if you're in Massachusetts, if you're, you're in Pennsylvania, uh, please make an effort to come to the city because it's going to be a really, really great evening. It's going to be a really, really great afternoon and evening, July 10th. July 10th is going to be an awesome day. It is going to be an awesome day in New York City. Uh, the Center for Political Innovation is marching ahead, um, and we're having a great event, and I really hope that you can be there. It is going to be awesome. It's going to be great. So mark your calendar, and, and if for some reason you can't make it to the event, but you want to just give a contribution to the Center for Political Innovation to help us help us have it and make sure it runs smoothly, that we have all the funds we need to get people to town, to get the, you know, the, the sets and the cameras and everything in line. You can donate at this link. You can send a donation via Stripe. Uh, this goes to the Center for Political Innovation. So 
you can also send us a link, a donation. If, if you can't make it or if you just want to help out in general, you can send a donation. So we do appreciate that. So now I am getting to the part of the show where I answer your super chat questions. Um, so hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Make sure you crush the subscribe button because YouTube has a wha wacky habit of unsubscribing people. Uh, which I do not know why they do that, but it the algorithm is rigged to unsubscribe people, you know, automatically, and we don't we don't appreciate that. We know social media is completely rigged, right? And I've been over that many times. The Twitter files, Matt Taibbi, you know, I don't need to. You all are a smart bunch of people. I don't need to reiterate that. Maybe I can talk about it on a future stream. Um, but um, you know, um, you know, uh, maybe I can talk about that on a future stream. But regardless, um, you know, please crush the subscribe button, crush the notifications bell, because YouTube is not our friend. YouTube is not our friend, to say the least. Um, and so uh, on that note, uh, on that note, I am going to get to the part of the program where I answer super chat questions. Um, I want to remind you all that you are the the 10 percent, right? There's, you know, if I look at how many people end up watching these streams. It's usually between one and 2,000, right? There's about 142 people watching right now. Uh, you all have the privilege. You're the cream of the crop, the 10%, I could call you, who have the ability to actually actively interact with these streams. You have the ability to make this stream go however you want. If there's a topic you're interested in, something you're wondering about, something that you'd like to hear me talk about or respond to, you can send me a super chat and influence the stream as it goes. Uh, other people who watch afterwards do not have such an ability. So if there's some, any of you, any among you who would like to get me talking um, about, um, about anything in particular, please send me a super chat to give me something to talk about in our stream because we only have two of them here and uh, I've only got two things to respond to and that's not much of a second half of our show. So send me a super chat, uh, get me talking. First super chat question. What is the likelihood that the Russian Federation and Belarus join into one country? There is a renewed call for this uh, that I have seen uh, because of the fact that the war is happening in Ukraine and the Belarusian military and the Russian mil military are working together. Right now, this is where it gets very confusing. I am not Russian. I do not speak Russian. I am not of Russian heritage. I may work at a Russian company, but I have no authority to speak on on certain matters. And I have heard people from this region get very fired up about this kind of stuff. So I am not going to I'm just telling you some of what I've heard. But, you know, the name Belarus, Belarusia. The translation, from what I understand, is white Russia and that in the Tsarist Empire, it was considered to be a region of Russia, but it was a certain group of people who had a certain, you know, dialect, uh, you know, they spoke a certain dialect of the language. They, they lived in a certain region. They had a certain culture and the Bolsheviks declared them to be a nation, uh, gave them a written language, uh, you know, declared them to be a nation. Um, but there are many people in Russia and in Belarus who say, well, you know, white Russia, that's like South Dakota. That's like North Dakota. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, you know, you can't, you, you, we're Russian, right? We're just Belarusian, right? Now, there's obviously a lot of people in Belarus who don't feel that way and are adamant that, they're, no, 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 we're a completely separate people, completely separate nationality, right? And I can't comment on that because I am not from this region. And I mean, I'm, it's not for me to go around and say, you're not a nation or you are a nation. Not for Caleb, an Irish American guy, to go around telling people in a part of the world that I'm not very familiar with. I've been over there a few times. It's not for me to go around and tell people in that part of the world whether or not they constitute a nationality or not. However, what's important to remember, and this is why it all kind of gets back to neoliberalism, right? After the fall of the Soviet Union, all across the former Eastern Bloc, there was a huge implementation of economic austerity. Country after country after country had austerity imposed onto it. Um, Country after country, right? Um, Belarus elected Alexander Lukashenko. And Alexander Lukashenko 
very tall, huge man and a communist, proud of the Soviet heritage, draws heavily from Marxism, Leninism, considers you know himself to be the best years of his life to have when he was a communist, calls himself a communist, has called himself a communist on many occasions. They elected Lukashenko. Now, Lukashenko, it's communism mixed in. He's very culturally conservative and anti-gay. He's also very, um, what is he? He's, he's, you know, he's, I don't know. He, there's some conspiracy theories and all of that, but he's an anti-imperialist. He's a populist and he draws heavily, he's heavily influenced by Marxism. Lukashenko refused to dismantle the socialist state. Um, and I actually have this book here about the history of Belarus. If you want to learn about the history of Belarus, I recommend you read this book, The Last Soviet Republic, Alexander Lukashenko's Belarus. It's a great book. And it talks about how Alexander Lukashenko refused to dismantle the state-run economy of Belarus. Uh, he was an anti-imperialist uh, and he was opposed to neoliberalism and he maintained the socialist control of the economy. And I believe even today, the communist party is the largest political party represented in their government. Soviet memorials are everywhere. They admire and honor Stalin, etc. cetera. Right. Um, uh, and, oh, here's a good super chat, right? I'll write it down. And, um, and because of that, because of that, Belarus was called the last Soviet Republic. It was called the last, it was called a dictatorship. And there have been many attempts to destabilize the country with color revolutions, foment rioting in the streets and protests. They've done everything they can to try and destabilize and overthrow the government of Belarus because they won't implement neoliberal economic reforms. Um, but they've withstood all of them. Okay. Writing it down. They have withstood all of them. And they have withstood these attempts to overthrow them. Every so often, Lukashenko has a fight with Putin, uh, and they fight with Putin. But it's become very clear that despite whatever differences exist between Putin and Lukashenko, uh, Belarus and Russia are much better friends than they'll than Belarus will ever be with America. And that now there's a war going on. Belarus knows what side it's on. Um, and that I understand that in Belarus, there's a number of people that say we ought to just join the Russian Federation, you know. Um, you know, Bel you know, Lukashenko will remain our leader. He's the leader of Belarus, but we'll just become a formal part, you know, a, a republic within the Russian Federation. There's some people who feel that way. Um, maybe it'll happen, right? I think the only way that that would ever happen, again, this is based on my observations, is that there would have to be, there would have to be a level of autonomy, right? Lukashenko has his own way of doing things, you know, and Putin and Russia have their way of doing things. And that, there would have to be some kind of level of regional autonomy, I believe. Now, I understand, if I understand correctly, Chechnya, uh, you know, part of the way that the situation in Chechnya was resolved was that there were there were new levels of autonomy granted to Chechnya, right? That um, that that in order to you know kind of bring the unrest and the foreign fomented Islamist insurgency in Chechnya to a close and to stabilize Chechnya, the Russian Federation did grant Chechnya kind of a newer level of autonomy. Uh, so maybe some kind of arrangement like that could be made for Belarus and Belarus would would with that new kind of arrangement, the understanding they can continue to do things the Belarus Lukashenko way. Maybe that could happen. Maybe not. I would only be in favor of that if the people of of Russia and Belarus overwhelmingly wanted it. Um, but, you know, who knows if the situation in Ukraine doesn't deescalate soon, it may become a situation where um, where that is a military necessity. Um, and that would be a deeply tragic situation, right? You know, I mean, you know, you would want, you know, if, if Belarus and Russia decided to become one country, you would want that to be because both of those countries thought it was in their overall interest as a nation and their economy and their population. You would want that. However, you know, it could be something that's forced by military circumstances. 
Um, and that, that is, you know, that would be very unfortunate. That would be very unfortunate if that that's forced by military situation circumstances, but it could happen. It very well could happen. Oh, here's a good question. What do you think motivated souls and eats into right? Very good. Um, very, very good. All right. Next question. Um, what would socialism look like in America? Socialism in America will come about as the result of a huge awakening of the American people. The American people will have to come into politics and become much more politically activated than ever before. And that would likely come as the result of a very big crisis. The circumstances in the country would deteriorate to the point that average Americans have no choice but to get involved in the political process. But the only way that such a crisis could turn into socialism is that when the crisis escalates to that point, there's big organizations, revolutionary organizations, capable of then mobilizing all the newly politicized people, mobilizing and organizing them and providing them ideology and leadership. A revolution requires three things. In order to have a revolution, you have to have three things. One, you have to have a serious crisis in society and the government, a crisis so big that even the rich are fighting among themselves. Two, you have to have a revolutionary organization capable of mobilizing. Uh, I'm sorry. Two, you have to have mass rebellions among the people. Right? The people have to become politically awakened because of the political crisis and involved and rebelling, et cetera. And three, you then have to have a revolutionary organization capable of transforming the rebellions among the people and the crisis among the rich into a seizure of power. And this is a quote. This is Vladimir Lenin, actually. You know, this is what he laid out. He lays this out. He said, if you have a revolution, you have to have those three things. You don't have those th three things. You don't have a revolution. Um, I can actually pull up the actual quotes from Lenin where he lays this out, right? Um, old way. What does Lenin say, right? Um, oh, here we go. Here we go. All right. Uh, this is what Lenin said about how you can have a revolution, right? He said, what generally speaking are the symptoms of a revolutionary situation? We shall certainly not be mistaken if we indicate the following three major symptoms. One, when it is impossible for the ruling classes to maintain their rule without any change. When there is a crisis in one form or another among the upper class, a crisis in policy of the old ruling class, leading to a fissure through which the dis discontent and indignation of the masses bursts forth. For a revolution to take place, it is usually insufficient for the lower classes uh, uh, not to want uh, to live in the old way. It is necessary that for the upper classes to be unable to live in the old way. Two, when the suffering in one of the oppressed classes have grown to a more acute than usual. And three, when as a consequence of the above causes, there is a considerable increase in the activities of the masses who uncomplainingly allow themselves to be robbed in peace times, but in turbulent, in turbulent times are drawn by such circumstances uh, by the crisis of the upper classes into independent historical action. And then he goes on to explain that it requires a revolutionary organization to pull them into uh, um independent historical action. So there you go. You, in order to have a revolution, you must have a crisis in society that is so deep that even the capitalists are fighting with each other. You have to have a, a, a you know mass suffering among the population where the people are, are becoming, you know, you know, rebellious and, and engaged. And three, you must ultimately um, have at that point uh, a revolutionary organization capable of pulling the masses into independent historical action. All right. And so, all right. Um, China's new law on relations. Wrote it down. All right. Hold on. Hold on. All right. Um, so the next. Uh, oh, but but so what would socialism look like in the United States? So you have to imagine a situation in the United States like that where the population is so politically engaged that you could have a revolution, 
where there is a mass revolutionary organization that's capable of harnessing the sentiments of a population that is in, in a situation where they have no choice but to become political. Under such circumstances, the revolutionary organization that was capable of mobilizing the masses would then come to power, right? And, you know, lead to a set of policies that would be first intended to address the crisis, but would address the crisis in ways that cut into the old system and defeat the power of the rich. And that's what our four point economic plan is, right? You know, these are policies that cut into the power of the capitalists, right? You're using the government to mobilize, to rebuild. You're nationalizing our natural resources and saying the capitalists can't make profits from them. You're seizing control of the banks and canceling the debt. Uh, you're, you're enacting an economic bill of rights that cuts into the power of the rich to liquidate the crisis. So that's the first stage it would take. It would take the form of liquidating the crisis by cutting into the power of the rich. That's the first thing it would it would be. But then after that, it would be a government that comes out of a popular mobilization of the people enacting policies that would oversee the growth and the expansion of the economy and living standards of the population going up and people living a much more comfortable life. Now, I believe a couple things. We don't really know because we don't know when the crisis will become intense enough that we have to have socialism in America. And on top of that, we don't know, um, you know, we don't know, you know, what the contradictions in society will be at that time that will be. I mean, we don't know when this will happen exactly. But one, I, there's a couple of things that I think will definitely be, I can guess, I mean, I could be wrong, but I, I would estimate would be a big part of socialism and American characteristics. One is that I think we would have to have a separation of church and state. You know, in Britain, they have a state religion. I was talking to Jyoti Bra, you know, she's from Britain and they have a state religion in Britain. It's called the Church of England. And it works. And you know why it works? Because the British people are not religious at all, right? It's a largely secular society. People don't think about religion that much. Maybe a majority of the population believes in God, but barely anybody goes to church on Sunday. And that Britain is a highly non-religious society. So they have a state religion, the Church of England. And they, you know, the Church of England puts a crown on the queen's head and kids learn learn about the church of religion when they're in the, the church of England, when they're in school, they, they teach them about the Bible, but they don't take it seriously. And that's that. That works in England because they're such a secular society in America. We could never have a state religion because in America, if you try, imagine, imagine we tried to have a Catholic government in America. If we tried to have a Catholic government in America, there would be riots in the streets in New York city uh, the Jewish folks would rise up and revolt against it. The Muslims would rise up and revolt against it. Uh, you know, uh, you know, the people from other parts of the world, you know, uh, there's a, a lot of immigrant communities that are very, very evangelical and Protestant. They would rise up against it. It wouldn't happen. Right. If you tried to have a Catholic government in Tennessee and Alabama, uh, that wouldn't fly. Right. If you tried to have a Catholic government in any part of this country. Right. People wouldn't accept it. You tried to have a Protestant government, right? Let's say we had tried to have a Baptist government. Let's say we tried to have a congregational or a, a Lutheran government. It wouldn't work. And the problem with a state religion is that a state religion can only be one religion. And that would never work, right? And we got a lot of atheists in America. We got a lot of Hindus. We got a lot of Muslims. We could never have a state religion in America. We, we could never do it. It could never happen. Because the American people are too religious. In a country where no one really cares about religion, it works. In a country like this, where religion is a really big part of people's identity, you could never have a state religion. The reason that the, that, that the first line of the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights of the U.S. Constitution is Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. The reason for that is because of the fact that when the Constitution was being put together, many of the states wouldn't ratify it because most of the colonies, the 13 colonies, they existed on the basis of religious identity. Massachusetts was founded by the Puritans. The Puritans, the Pilgrims, right? They came over on the Mayflower and the Puritans established Massachusetts. 
And the Quakers established Pennsylvania, or Penn's Woods. They followed William Penn, the Quaker leader. Maryland was established by Roman Catholics. It was Mary's Land, Maryland. And the same for Virginia. Virginia was also established by Roman Catholics for the Virgin Mary, Virginia. However, right, Rhode Island was established by, I don't even remember, was it Roger Williams or one of those guys who had a fallen out with the Puritans? He didn't agree with the Puritans. He was a heretic, and so he had to flee and form his own, his own religion, right? Um, and, uh, you know, all throughout, you know, all throughout the 13 colonies, all these 13 colonies had many, nine out of the 13 colonies had a state religion, and they were all different. They weren't all the same religion. And the only way the smaller states would agree to sign on and ratify the U.S. Constitution was if there was an understanding, if it was clarified, that there could be no state religion because they feared the big states would impose their religion on the smaller states. And I think that that is just, if you look at the way U.S. society is, with so many different immigrant groups, and so many different, you know, religions and religion being such a big part of the culture in certain areas, and there's no way we could ever have a state religion in America. We would have to have the separation of church and state. So I think when socialism comes to America, it will maintain the separation of church and state. Second, um, I believe that there will be a big market sector in American socialism for a long time, maybe not forever, but for a long time. Um, you know, why? Uh, because of the fact that Americans believe in growth and, you know, that's the great thing about America. You can start your own business. You can, you can go out and invent something and that it would have to be clear to the American people, uh, that, that when socialism came here, it would not take away their ability to start a business, to become an entrepreneur. Right. And I think that there would have to be some kind of entrepreneur's rights or something written in to the American socialism. It would be like, you know, the banks and the factories, the major industries have to be, you know, state run. But, you know, the right of someone to open a store, the right of someone to invent a new product, you know, there would be some kind of like assurance of the right of the entrepreneur in American socialism, I think. But there you go. All right. Next question. All right. Next question. Have you read the writings of Simone Bolivar and what do they tell us about the Bolivarian project and its origins? Well, OK, a couple of things. I haven't read directly the writings of Simone Bolivar, but I have read what Hugo Chavez has said about them. I've read many books on the history of Bolivarian socialism. And, you know, Simone Bolivar was not a communist and Simone Bolivar was not not a socialist. Simone Bolivar was a populist kind of. And he was also kind of an elitist and he was against slavery and he was he was inspired by the French Revolution on the ideals of the French Revolution. He believed in life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness, the right of man or whatever. He didn't like Spanish colonialism. He didn't like the Spanish Empire and he believed in civil liberties and he's considered the liberator of South America. He believed that all of South America should be one country. Uh, that is one thing he believed. Um, but he also did believe in some kind of oligarchy. And there's many places in Simone Bolivar's writings where he argues that you needed some kind of oligarchy. Um, you know, I think Simone Bolivar was largely a positive figure. And the reason that his name has been given to the Bolivarian Socialist Project, and this is, that's, that's the second part of your question, the reason that his name has been attached to it is because of the fact that Simone Bolivar was the liberator of South America and because he believed in one country for South America. He believed it should all be one country. And Bolivarian socialism largely believes that. It believes that there should be one country for all of South America and that they should throw off the domination of the foreigners, that they should be free to invest as they please. That's what they take from Simon Bolivar. Uh, he did believe in economic development and economic growth. Um, but other than that, you know, there's a lot you can criticize with Simone Bolivar. But you know what? There's a lot you can criticize with Thomas Jefferson. There's a lot you can criticize with George Washington. There's a lot you can criticize with Alexander Hamilton, right? And that, you know, he was in, you know, the early 1800s, I believe. He was the, the liberator, uh, the guy who was fighting the Spanish colonizers and, you know, fought for the freedom of the various countries of South America. And is kind of the, he's the George Washington of South America. And Bolivarianism is a movement, an ultra patriotic movement. It's socialism with South American characteristics, right? Bolivarian socialism. 
uh, you know, and they created the ALBA Bank, the Bolivarian Alternative for Latin America Bank uh, that was involved in creating infrastructure projects throughout the region. Um, you know, I mean, you have to imagine that would be, you know, Bolivarian socialism is imagine that the Communist Party, you know, they entered an alliance, they built like a united front and they came to power during the 1930s and they called it Washingtonian socialism. Would they really be enacting the policies of George Washington? Well, George Washington believed in economic development. He believed in independent United States, but not really, right? I don't see Bolivarian socialism as like Simon Bolivar. What I will say, which is interesting, is that Hugo Chavez, and this is, I didn't realize this. Hugo Chavez didn't come from nowhere. Hugo Chavez had run his, his, wow, my door just slammed. Um, he had run his movement for the Fifth Republic uh, for a long time in Venezuela. He was a, a political figure. He was a military, a leader of the military, and he had his own political party. And he had been around since the 80s, right? He had, he had had his own political party. Uh, he had run in elections. And, and he had been a, a kind of explicitly anti-communist figure at one point, right? Uh, many people say that Hugo Chavez wanted to be like the Juan Perón of Venezuela, right? He was from the military, he said he was against both capitalism and socialism. He just wanted a strong Venezuela, what was good for Venezuela. Uh, he was a former paratrooper. He had indigenous uh, blood and Afro-Venezuelan blood. He wasn't light-skinned. He was a very large, physically strong man, um, you know, and he was a good speaker and a good orator. And he was around, right? He attempted a military coup. Uh, he was a leader of the military. And, you know, in 1992, uh, he attempted to seize power after there was a riot in Caracas, after there was big riots in Caracas because they were raising the price of public transportation. Um, you know, uh, because of that, uh, he thought, well, this is my time. And he tried to have the military seize control and he failed and he was thrown in prison. But he was wildly popular. And and there were like all across um you know, Venezuela at the time the coup happened, even though it failed, there were big protests supporting the coup, right? There were people that marched in the streets, the Communist Party and others marched in the streets supporting the coup, but it failed. He went to prison. Um, and while he was in prison, his popularity increased. Uh, the economic situation in the country was deteriorating and he got out of prison um, and he ran for president in 1998 and he won and he took office in 1999. Um, and Hugo Chavez, when he first took office, he said he was for neither capitalism nor socialism. And he preached the third way. Uh, he believed in what he called the third way, uh, which was neither capitalist or socialism, but was kind of, he was Bolivar, it drew from Simon Bolivar and drew from, you know, the best for the country. Hugo Chavez didn't start becoming a communist or a Marxist until 2003. Um, and that was 2002, the U S government you know, tried to overthrow him. There was an attempted coup against him. Uh, and the Communist Party had his back and were his biggest supporters, um, you know, uh, and Cuba supported him. And uh, a lot of the rich people who'd originally backed him opposed him. And then it was after he came back into power, after the military brought him back into power, there was kind of an uprising among the rank and file soldiers. At that point, he started saying he was a Marxist and, you know, quoting socialism, quoting Hugo Chavez. Bolivarianism, look, ideas don't define reality, okay? And this is one thing that is really important to remember. There have been many his examples in history of people that were marching to cut off a king's head, and as they were marching to cut off the king's head, they sang, God save the king, okay? That, you know, the French Revolution, the march to Versailles, it was a big part of the French Revolution, the, the peasants that were marching to Versailles they were marching to beg the king for food. They mobilized them all. They said, you know, our king is great and we're going to go ask our king for food. And the bourgeoisie of, of Paris mobilized all these poor people of Paris, got all these poor people of Paris, said, we're all going to, we love the king. Don't you love the king? We love the king. We're all going to march out to Versailles to beg the king for food. And so they got all the poor people to march to Versailles to beg the king for food. But when they got there, they arrested the king and eventually they cut his head off. Well, ideas don't define reality, right? That ideas are a reflection of the economic base. Hugo Chavez didn't believe in socialism. He believed in the third way. He was a nationalist. He was more or less a, a 
a pan South American, Latin American nationalist. But in order to carry out his program of making a stronger Venezuela, he had to move towards socialism. And the Communist Party and the labor unions became an important part of his coalition. And the bourgeoisie, who'd originally been part of his united front, turned against him. And even though he originally didn't believe in Marxism, and he had this ideology he invented called Bolivarianism, Bolivarianism turned quickly into Bolivarian socialism and Bolivarian Marxism. And this is because ideas do not define reality. Reality defines ideas, right? This is, this is Marxism. And Hugo Chavez was forced by material circumstances whether he wanted it or not, he was forced by material conditions to move towards socialism. And that is what you need to remember. And that's why I no longer, I'm starting to move away from judging leaders by whether they call themselves socialists or not. You know, look, uh, for example, El Salvador, right? The people who came before Bukele, right? The Marx, they were supposedly Marxists, but they were not enacting Marxist policies. Bukele, who's in power now, he's not a Marxist. He's a Bonapartist, but he's doing more Marxist stuff. He's teaming up with China. He's building infrastructure. He's asserting control of the, over the means of production. So, like, I like Bukele. And, you know, the Marxists who were in power before him, unlike the Marxists in Nicaragua or Venezuela, they weren't really doing much. So Bukele is better than them. Does it matter to me that Bukele doesn't call himself a Marxist? And these people do. I mean. It's not like we should totally discount it, but that's not what matters. What matters is what you do. You can call yourself anything you want. You can call yourself a Marxist or a fascist or a dentist or a, 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 an anthropologist or whatever you want to call yourself. Okay? But the matter, what kind of policies do you actually enact? That is the question. Um, and that is how we should judge Bolivarianism. And that if you judge it on the basis of reading Simone Bolivar, you're about 100 years, 200 years behind. Um, you know, um, that's my answer to that, Simon, is that, that, you know, Bolivarianism as a movement, you can't judge it by Simone Bolivar. Simone Bolivar had his limitations, and Bolivarianism, to be fair, does have its limitations. You know, I was in Venezuela, and I heard from the Venezuelans an endless amount of self-criticism for all of the, the problems that they've had since the death of Hugo Chavez and many mistakes that they made, et cetera. I mean, I still think the fact that they're still in power shows they must have doing, done something right, and they still have done dramatic things to improve the, the living standards of much of the population. So I think they deserve credit where it's due, but there are limitations to the policies. So, and, you know, Evo Morales, his policies in Bolivia were much more economically successful but he didn't secure control of the state. In Venezuela, the military has been completely changed. It's trained in Cuba. They have the Bolivarian militias. They control the state apparatus in Venezuela, and that's why they're still in power. Evo Morales managed the economy much better. Uh, he had a Marxist economist. Uh, he had a much more, much more, you know, diversified economy. It wasn't reliant on oil the way Venezuela is. He enacted a lot of economic reforms and. The, the policies of Evo Morales in Bolivia were much more economically beneficial to the population, but he didn't control the state. The military and the policing agencies were largely under the control of people who didn't agree with him, and they waited until they had the right moment, and they removed him. And now the left is back in power in Bolivia, but it's not the same, right? Bolivia is, it's been a counter-revolution. But it, it, it was a counter-revolution because they didn't have a full revolution. They didn't change the state in Bolivia. The military, the policing agencies, never became fully under the control of the revolutionary anti-imperialist forces, even though their economic policies were better. And this, is, this points to what Lenin points out in the state and revolution. The nature of the state is the state is a body of armed men. Uh, so there you go. There you go. Now, the next question I've got here, uh, what is your favorite Lincoln speech? I actually might do something really wild here and put on a video of, of someone doing my favorite Lincoln speech. And that my favorite Lincoln speech is Lincoln's second inauguration speech. Um, and I think I can find it's a very short speech. And I think I can find an actor performing Lincoln's second inaugural speech. And I, I can. Here it is. 
Lincoln's second inaugural speech. Um, yeah, and so I I don't know. Um, will I be able to? Will I get away with putting this video on here, or is it gonna mess with me? Um, um, is it gonna mess with me or not? Uh, it's from a documentary. It looks like this is an actor doing it. Um, uh, I don't know. Will I get away with this? I mean, it looks like it's on the channel of David Swanson. I, I think I can get away with this. All right. I think YouTube will let me maybe, you know, let's see what they do to me. But I'm going to I'm going to put on Lincoln's second inaugural speech uh, just just so we can we can watch it. You can see why it's a good speech. Um, you can see um, you can see why it's a good speech. Um, so there you go. There you go. Hold your horses, everybody. I'm downloading Lincoln's second inaugural speech, and we will watch it here on this stream. Uh, so there we go. We're going to watch, um, you know, Lincoln's second inaugural speech because it's very short. Uh, I don't even think we're going to watch the whole thing. We're going to watch just a, a clip from it. Um, you know, um, so there you go. There you, there you go. Hold your horses, everybody. Hopefully it finishes parsing the clip soon, and we'll just put that on. We will put on Lincoln's second inaugural speech uh, when it's ready. Uh, we'll just do that. I guess I'll answer some of these other super chats before we get there. What do you think motivated Solzhenitsyn to write? One, Solzhenitsyn was politically repressed, right? He was put in a gulag. Uh, I guess during the Second World War, he was accused, I believe, of trying to engage in some kind of revolt against the Soviet government. Uh, and he was put in a prison camp and he had very negative experiences in that prison camp. And so he was motivated by his own experience. Uh, that would be my guess. Second, um, I would say he was motivated by his orthodox faith, that Solzhenitsyn was very, very religious. Um, and he was a very, very religious orthodox Christian. And he saw the Soviet government as being an atheistic government and contrary to his traditionalist conservative views. The thing is, I don't think Solzhenitsyn was a dishonest actor. I don't think he was, you know, but I think that he, he really believed what he was saying, but U.S. intelligence thought he was useful. Right. They thought he was useful in making anti-communist propaganda. Right. They thought, oh, here's this guy, this Russian guy who's very, very Russian. Right. And he's also very, very anti-communist. And we can we can use him uh, to demonize the Soviet Union. He lived under it. Right. I mean, that he he was useful to Western imperialism. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't think that there's anything too controversial about acknowledging that that's who he was. I Solzhenitsyn is loved by right-wingers and conservatives. People like Jordan Peterson really, really like him. And it's like, I'm not saying you shouldn't read his work. It's it's very important anti-communism, but he does not represent, what annoys the crap out of me is that people like Jordan Peterson or people, conservatives I meet all the time, they think that they read that stuff and that they have a whole understanding of the entire experience. And if they think that that's accurate, why does poll after poll after poll say that in every formerly communist country of the Eastern Bloc, life was better before the fall. Not just in Russia, not just in Poland, not just in Romania, not just in Czechoslovakia, in every single one of them. Nostalgia for communism is widespread. Oh, but I read Solzhenitsyn, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's Solzhenitsyn's views. That's Solzhenitsyn's views, but that was one man who represented what very anti-communist and very orthodox conservative Russians felt. He's not the only guy, right? On this stream, I talked about the guy from Bulgaria and his grandfather who built the roads. I've talked about Stalin, who's wildly popular in Russia nowadays, right? And that Solzhenitsyn, one guy, does not represent every person who ever lived under communism's experience. And it is so annoying. I see this all the time from conservatives and from Americans in general. Right. It's that, well, I talked to a Miami Cuban. And so therefore, I know all about communism in Cuba. No, you know, one person's experience, a person whose experience with communism in Cuba was so bad that they came to the enemy country, the United States. Right. If I moved to Russia. Right. Me, Caleb Maupin, if I moved to Russia. Right. If I got so if I got so mad at the American government, the American government went after me and I was forced to flee the country and move to Russia. And Russians interviewed me. Would they get 
an assessment of America that would be an accurate assessment of what every American believed? Of course not. They'd be hearing the views of somebody who was so alienated from American society, they had to flee to the so-called enemy country. Right? And that's what these people don't get. Right? That, look, there with, with anti-communists, there's a huge amount of I want to believe. And it's easy because, it, you know, it's easy for anti-communists because it's easy for them to maintain their anti-communism. One, because we live in a very anti-communist society. And two, all the so-called communists, that there used to not be any communists in America, right? It used to be communists in America were an obscure thing. But now all of a sudden there are communists. There's bread tube. And the bread tubers agree with the anti-communists. They repeat all the smears about Stalin. They they believe, they agree with them. So, you know, if you're a conservative nowadays, right? You hate Joe Biden. America's getting worse. And the people who support Joe Biden call themselves communists. And those people who support Joe Biden agree with all the stuff you read in Solzhenitsyn or you read in anti-communism. Why wouldn't you be an anti-communist, right? You don't want to be like Biden. The so-called communists are defending Biden. And on top of that, the so-called communists repeat anti-communist lies and smears. I do not understand. You know, Ron DeSantis has passed these anti-communist laws. He requires them to teach anti-communist stuff in the schools of Florida now. And Vosh and ContraPoints and all these people are mad about it. Why? The anti-communist lies he's teaching are all lies that they repeat on their streams. Vosh says that anyone who defends Stalin is just like a Nazi, that Stalin killed more people than Hitler, blah, 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 blah. So why, why do they care? He's teaching the same stuff that they preach. Why do they care? I do not understand this. I'm supposed to care? I, it's to trick people like me into going along with them and their anti-Republican screed. But the shit that Ron DeSantis is requiring to be taught to, to, to school children about the Soviet Union, about China and stuff, is all the same shit that the DSA believes, right? The people that run Democratic Socialism of America, they believe all that shit. They're anti-Stalinists. Oh, communism killed a gajillion million people. Oh, we're nothing like the Soviet Union. It was hell on it. So why do they care? Why? I do not understand this, right? You know, I mean, it's like, yeah, the right-wingers are anti-communist. That's true. But so are the so-called left, right? Vosh says I deserve to be murdered, right? He said on his stream that he advocated violence against me, right? Uh, he thinks that tankies, anyone who defends the Soviet Union or defends Cuba or defends, you know, Venezuela is the same as a Nazi and deserves to be beaten up and killed. So it's like, wait a second, you know, it's like, oh, well, all, oh, the right wingers, they're all anti-communist. So are they. They just call their anti-communism communism, which is stupid. But, you know, the, the, the woke left, they hate Russia. They hate China. They hate Cuba. They hate North Korea, right? They hate all the existing communist countries. Uh, all they want to talk about is stuff that they're not into in the communist countries, like the trans thing, like, you know, white privilege, you know, you know, is that, you know, read the writings of Fidel Castro. See if you ever find the phrase white privilege, you won't find it. Right. And, you know, so these people are anti-communist too, and they want us to support them because the right wing are anti-communist. The only difference is that the woke left call their anti-communism communism, right? They have given a different name to their anti-communism, right? Conservatives, when I meet them, are willing to talk to me. They know that I'm critical of U.S. foreign policy. They know I'm critical of the lockdowns. They know I'm critical of the mainstream media, and they're willing to talk to me. Leftists, when I meet them, say, oh, my God, you're spreading conspiracy theories. Oh, my God, I can't listen to you. Oh, my God, you deserve to be locked in jail. You should have your Facebook banned. I can't listen to you, blah, 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 blah. Right? That should tell you right there who wants to kill you and who doesn't agree with you. Right? Right? I mean, you know, and, and people say, well, I just heard Donald Trump. Donald Trump said he gave this speech. Yeah, yeah, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Whatever. Whatever. OK. When conservatives at this point talk about communism, most of them are just talking about the woke left and they've been lied to and led to believe that somehow China and North Korea and Cuba are the same as the woke left, which they ain't. Breadtube, on the other hand, they may call themselves communists or Marxists or socialists. But they want to murder us. Right. They want to kill us and they say that we're all Nazis. Anyone who. Anyone who questions the war in Ukraine, anyone who questions the lockdowns, 
anyone who questions the vaccine mandates, anyone who questions this, we're all secret Nazis. We should be banned. They stalk you on social media. They try to get, you know, if you ever are going to speak with somebody, they put pressure on them to not associate with you. So, I mean, the conservatives don't do that to me, you know? You know, so I, I think we know right now who the main danger is. Now, that could change. That could change, right? It could be the conservatives. You know, Ron DeSantis became president. We could have a new anti-woke thing, and it could change. But right now, the synthetic left are the main danger, and there's just no way around that question. They are the main danger. And when people try to deny that, it's a word game. I don't care. Let me emphasize once again, I do not care who calls themselves a communist and who doesn't. Because the overwhelming majority of people in America who call themselves communists at this point think communis communism means you have purple hair or blue hair or green hair or pink hair and lots of nose piercings. And you uh, think that all conservatives are Nazis. They're like white nationalists, man. I saw a YouTube video that said like Republicans are all like white nationalists, man. You know, and they they are obsessed with the trans issue. Oh, my God, that person's transphobic. You know, the other day, my friend and I were arguing about whether or not it's it's transphobic to have male whether they should call it female or a gender neutral postage or, you know, male sounds M A A M A I L sounds kind of like M A L E. And that's kind of like not inclusive. And we think the word male for the postage is like, is like transphobic. Cause like, what about people that are female or what about people that feel, you know, that they're neither, you can't have male, right. You know, you can't have, po you got to call it postage because male is a fan. Like, these are obnoxious human beings. They're just obnoxious human beings. And I want nothing to do with these people. And if I want working people to listen to me, I can't tell them I'm that. Right? I mean, at this point, right, the whole Republican Party is mobilized against these people. Right? And half the Democrats are against these people. Why do you think RFK is so popular? RFK hates these people. RFK is running as not one of these people. So, like, like, the overwhelming majority of the country hates wokeism. And communism has been associated with wokeism. And, and people cannot stand these. You know, I'm an annoying teenager. Yeah, like I, you know, I, 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 I don't say mothers. I say womb havers. Yeah, that's treatment. You know, I mean, it's just, they're just obnoxious human beings. You know, I, uh, teacher, you, you, you shouldn't have us read this book in class because I read on the internet that the writer, the guy who wrote it, one time shook hands with somebody, who one time shook hands with somebody, who one time shook hands with somebody who was like said something transphobic on Facebook. And like, I'm not going to read this book because it's racist. I'm going to make a YouTube video about how my professor wanted me to read a racist book. I mean, they're just obnoxious people. Right. They're just teenagers that have have got a mind virus. Right. They, they've got a really bad mind virus. Um, and I just I don't want to be associated with that. And it has nothing to do with communism or Marxism or the, nothing, nothing whatsoever to do with it. It's just this obnoxious, you know, I'm going to tell on you. You broke a rule. I'm going to tell on you. I gonna get social credit for telling on you. <laughs> All right, writing it down. I hope this Lincoln speech, you know, download. I don't know what's taking it so long. I've never. I mean, my internet must be really goddamn slow. This Lincoln speech is taking for fucking ever. But anyway, what is the ideal? Oh, yeah, it, it looks like it's almost ready, um, but very good super chat. Very good super chat. All right. Okay. Looks like we've finally got the Lincoln speech. So now I put it on the desktop. I put it on the desktop. And I think it's going to let me get away with showing this here on YouTube. Let's see if it shuts down my stream immediately afterwards or something. Let's see. But I, I think we can get away with this. I really do. I think that we can show the Lincoln speech. So let's do it. Let's do it. 
Let's do it. Hold on. Lincoln's second inaugural address. My, this is my favorite Lincoln speech. We're going to show a clip of it on this stream if if social media, if, if it cooperates, right? Oh, here we go. Here we go, right? And we have to skip through. It's from like a documentary. The second inaugural address. Expected for the war. Direct. Fellow countrymen. Four years ago, all thoughts were anxiously directed to an impending civil war. All dreaded it. All sought to avert it. Neither party expected for the war the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. And Douglas was there in the front row listening to Lincoln's inaugural address. There's a great photograph that shows Lincoln at the lectern, Douglas with his big hair, that's how you can recognize him, and in the balcony is, is John Wilkes Booth. Yet if God wills that it continue, until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk. And until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. What you see in the second inaugural is blah, 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 not a certain... Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. Judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. His consciousness of something he's now telling with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle, and for his widow, and his orphan to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations yeah go and read lincoln's second inaugural address it's pretty good pretty good stuff all righty um all righty Hold on. All righty. Um, okay. Next question. Um, did you see China's new law on foreign relations? No. No, I did not. No, I mean, I, I can look into it. I, I can't comment on that now. But I, I it's funny how you phrase the question, right? Um, I think when I was in high school, we used to do like a quiz game. And uh, one of the questions would be, can you spell encyclopedia? Someone buzz in. No. Well, that's technically right. The question was, can you spell it? No. Right. You got to remember what the question is. Did you see this new law? No, I did not. But if you're asking my opinion on it, I have to do some research, Rice. I just have to research into it. Right. I know China is changing a lot of things right now that for a long time, they've been very open. There's been a lot of Western institutions and stuff that have existed in China and it's caused a lot of problems and that China is kind of reorienting itself to a situation where the West is not a welcome foreign investor, but it's causing problems and destabilization in the country. So I'll have to look into it um, and give you commentary. I don't want to say anything that's inaccurate. I owe it to my viewers to give you an accurate assessment. I know a lot of things in China, like the, the school system and a lot of things are very much changing right now as the USA just goes all in against them. It's unfortunate. All righty. All right. What is the ideal situation? For funding the arts, budding writers, painters, and is it government funding? I, yes, I think there should be some government funding for the arts because if arts is purely commercial, if it's purely commercial, uh, you you get what you have now, where they don't want to take a risk and they they dumb everything down to the lowest common denominator. This is what they're doing right now. They're dumbing everything down to the lowest common denominator. 
uh, to the point that, you know, I mean, we, we, they make the same movie over and over and over again. And it's awful because they don't want to take a risk. They want to return on their investment. Um, I think there should be some market incentive for the arts. If not, they're going to make movies no one likes, right? Um, so there's a balance. There's a balance to it. Um, but I think that, yes, yeah, some government funding is absolutely necessary so that people can take risks. There you go. Um, you love how I said blah, blah, blah to President Obama and forwarded past his comments. He's kind of a blowhard liar. Kudos. Well, I'm glad you like it, Flonius Punk. He is definitely that. Uh, one of those epic disappointments as a president. Um, look, I'm um, Barack Obama. Now, now, uh, the, 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 um, yeah, yeah, I mean, he's just he was uh, eight years of disappointment setting the stage for Donald Trump, who then set the stage for Biden. Yeah, yeah. Um, can't say I miss him. Can't say I miss him. Uh, but apparently he's heavily involved with Netflix. Uh, so, you know, if you watch Netflix, you're letting Barack Obama program your brain. And why is Netflix obsessed with cults? Why is everything a cult nowadays, right? They got a million documentaries on Netflix about cults. They even got comedies. I walk in. I don't watch much television because my wife, we have one television. My wife watches it and I don't, you know, I don't want to fight with her about what she's watching. And, you know, she'll, she'll turn on the TV and it's like every one of these comedy shows, documentaries is all about cults. Everything's a cult nowadays. Cults, 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 cults. Well, that comes from Barack Obama. He's heavily involved. He run, he doesn't, he, he's on the board of a, of a, a, a studio at Netflix. Susan Rice uh, was also on the board of Netflix. Susan Rice from the Obama administration. If you watch Netflix, you're basically saying, uh, hey, Barack, can you po program my mind, please? Can you program my mind, Barack? Barack, I want you to like, Tell me how to think. Can you tell me how to think, Mr. Barack? Okay, all right. My brain, open brain, pour in, pour it in, Barack. That's what you're doing if you watch Netflix. You know, not to say that you shouldn't be a connoisseur to some degree, you know what's out there, but you're watching the enemy when you watch Netflix. You're watching the enemy propaganda. And, you know, Netflix, there is a documentary on Netflix that features none other than myself. I have never watched it. I have no desire to see it. But every person in the world, people that I haven't spoken to in years, people that I met one time in another country, people that I went to school with have messaged me about it. Oh, my God, Caleb, you're in it. It's called like how to become a dictator, how to become a dictator or whatever. And apparently they use me I, uh, uh, when I was protesting at the White House. Right. Um, and there were these, you know, these Syrian terrorists that were supporting you know, the Syrian rebels that were killing people with chemical weapons and stuff. And I was shouting at them. I said, you're a terrorist murderer or something. They have used me, my image, to be the symbol of like a crazy mob or something. And twice in this documentary, they show none other than me in the Netflix documentary. So that right there tells you, right? I mean, you know, the fact that of all the people they could have chosen to be a crazy mob, they chose me. I'm the symbol of a crazy evil mob in a documentary called How to Become a Dictator, right? And if that doesn't tell you right there something, I don't think they just randomly picked me, right? That that photo, that that clip of me yelling, you know, I'm standing next to, next to uh, an African-American man. We were both members of the Workers' World Party, and we were shouting at the pro-bombing crowd of people that were supporting the bombing of Syria. 2013, we're in front of the White House. They, these people that were calling for the bombing of Syria, we were protesting. They were counter protesting us and we shouted at them. And they have a clip of me shouting at, at these counter protesters. Well, you know, I, I, I mean, what does that tell you right there? What does that tell you right there? I mean, Netflix is a psyop. It is absolutely a psyop. And it's brought to you by none other than Barack Obama and Susan Rice. And it's obsessed with cults. Everything's a cult. It's a cult. It's a cult. It's a cult. They got films about Scientology. They got films about religion. They got films about protest. Oh, my God. Don't join this. Don't join that. Don't join a group. Stay home and watch Netflix. Look, uh, I'm Barack Obama. Uh, we don't want you to join any uh, organizations. Uh, we think it's best you just stay home uh, and keep watching Netflix. Uh, and we'll show you documentaries about why uh, Bashar Assad is an evil dictator. And uh, we'll show uh, an image of Caleb Maupin. Uh, and he's uh, yelling. Uh, he's yelling. Uh, and and that's why you shouldn't become an evil dictator. Because you got Caleb Maupin uh, on, on Netflix. And he's doing all this yelling. Uh, so there you go. Uh, there you go. Um, that's, that's Caleb Maupin. Uh, you know, I mean, Netflix... Netflix is amazing, right? And it's like, I, I gotta, I cannot get over this, right? I, so many times I've been somewhere and I'm trying to interview somebody for RT. 
Hey, I'm with RT. Oh, no, I can't talk to you. RT is propaganda. Oh, give me a break. Right? RT bends over backwards to be balanced. We have a wider variety of views on RT than you'll ever find on American television. Right? And then the same person that's like, oh, I can't talk to you. That's propaganda. Goes home to watch uh, Netflix. They go to watch uh, How to Become a Dictator with Barack Obama, you know, telling you that, you know, I mean, it's just unbelievable. It's look, uh, it's unbelievable. Uh, I, Barack Obama, have set up this mind control operation uh, called Netflix uh, and I set it up and it's basically to brainwash you uh, to support wars uh, and to be afraid of joining any organization uh, that might uh, resist U.S. imperialism. Uh, that's what I did. Uh, I'm the president of the United States. Uh, that's how we're going to do it. Uh, so, uh, look, that's what we're doing. I'm Barack Obama. Uh, and I approve this message. So there you go. There you go. I don't know why. There you go. That's more of, the, more of an answer than you asked for, felonious, but that's what you got. What's the difference between imperialism and the export of capital? Well, the export of capital, um, I mean, to some degree or other happens under, I mean, you know, it's any corporation that goes outside of its own borders is technically the export of capital. Right. Uh, Lenin lists the export of capital as one of the main features. Um, one of the main features of of imperialism is the export of capital. But just because there's a company in one country and it goes to another country uh, does not make it imperialism. Right. The export of capital. Right. The export of capital just means that rather than it used to be under primitive industrial capitalism, the countries exported products. Right? You bought products from a country. The export of capital means you export the corporation, right? McDonald's goes all over the world. We don't export. Um, oh, glad you liked it, Felonius. We don't export French fries anymore. We export McDonald's, right? We don't export oil. We export Exxon Mobil, right? And that is a defining aspect of capitalism entering its imperialist stage. When the corporations based in Western countries spread all across the planet and dominate the global market, that's imperialism. However, you know, if if an African country, you know, if 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 Ethiopia, there's a company in Ethiopia that sets up shop you know, and opens an office in in Somalia is therefore Ethiopia an imperialist country. No. Right. And this is a game. There's all these people who want to make Russia and China imperialist. They're scared. It's because they're cowards. OK, let's just be honest about it. It's because they're goddamn cowards. That's the only reason they see that the imperialist government, the U.S. imperialists, the British imperialists, the French imperialists are mobilizing anti-Russia hostility. And they want to go, I sort of agree with you. I, I'm not I'm not for the enemy. Right. They don't understand what revolutionary defeatism is. And they don't have the courage to stand up to imperialism. And so they want to be like, well, maybe I can like pull some quotes from Lenin and like do some math. And somehow I can make Russia and China imperialist, too. And they play this game where because Lenin lists the export of capital as a feature of imperialism. Therefore, any country that exports a corporation is imperialist. Uh, that's not how it works. Right. If an Ethiopian company opens an office in Somalia, Ethiopia is not an imperialist country. Those five stage or five characteristics of imperialism are all a process. It's like as imperialism is emerging, this is how it happens. And they all they come as a set. Right. Carving out sphere of influence, trust cartels and syndicates. I, I mean, it's. It's a process that the monopolization of capital in the Western countries, the dominance of finance capital over industry, the export of capital with these giant trusts spreading across the planet, then carving out territory in the colonized world. That's what imperialism is. And it annoys me to see people bend over backwards to justify their own cowardice. That's what it is. All right. And I just there's no way around that. That's just what it is when people do that. It is cowardice. OK. You have to call it what it is. It is just cowardice, right? And they can dress it up in all this fancy language. And people say, oh, why does Caleb always assign? Because you can see what it is, right? If the U.S. imperialist government is mobilizing an all-out hostility to Russia, and your instinct is, how can I find a way to say Russia's imperialist so I can be against them too? You are a coward. Is it possible one could take that position and not be a coward? Sure. But if one is scrambling to find a way to have that position at this time, you're a coward. Next question. 
What's the significance of the Green Book? Well, the Green Book was Gaddafi's uh, manifesto document explaining the socialist economic system, the third universal theory of Libya. And he wrote it during what was called the Cultural Revolution in Libya, when Libya was transitioning to becoming a fully socialist society and solidifying itself ideologically. And the Green Book, it's only three chapters, and it's a brilliant, brilliant book. It critiques uh, democracy. It, it critiques uh, capitalism and it explains the basis of socialism. It lays out, you know, its position on social issues and women's rights. It's a brilliant book that kind of lays the basis for socialism with Libyan characteristics, if you want to call it that. The Libyan Islamic socialist kibbist system, green socialism in Libya. It lays out its principles and it's brilliant and talks for about popular committees and Soviets, basically, that you organize and, and how you can move toward having a total democracy. It's a brilliant piece of writing. That's why we published it. And we've sold over 2000 copies of our edition of the Green Book. You know, hundreds more have been distributed. But on Amazon alone, we've sold 2000 copies. Right. It was a great thing that we published it. And I recommend that everyone go and read the Green Book. And on that note, folks, we're we're. You know, we're almost hitting two hours and 45 minutes. It's been fun. I'll be back soon, but I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to put on the closing music. So thank you, everybody. It's been fun. Don't forget to come to New York City on July 10th and come to our rally at 3 p.m. and our event at 7 p.m. Um, and send a donation, uh, you know, if you can't come, right? Uh, love to have you there. And uh, yeah, we'll be doing another show soon. Um, so yeah, I'm going to put on the closing music. I'm going to put on the closing music. U.S. imperialism is now emerging throughout the world. Ever since World War II, U.S. imperialism and its followers have been continuously launching wars of aggression. But the people of various countries have been continuously waging revolutionary wars to defeat their aggression. And while the danger of a new world war still exists, and the people of all countries must get prepared, revolution is the main trend in the world today.